Hello everybody, welcome to Frame Trap. Today I am joined by Mike and Mike themselves, Michael Huber. Yo! And Mr. Michael Damiani. What's up? I feel like with all of these uh, lockdown frame traps, it's always tempting to just be like, hey, how are you holding up? It's always good to ask. <laughs> but doing something different, we did just have uh, an Xbox showcase, a Microsoft showcase. Mm-hmm. And I want to know kind of after that and just where you're at with next gen hype. Where are you feeling? Can you give it a numerical rating? Where's your head at? I'm on, I'm on like a 8 out of 10, probably. I don't think the Xbox event really moved the needle one way or the other. It was a disappointing event, but in the long run, I don't think it had any impact on my where my, my head is at, hmm. personally. I still have... I still think Microsoft can easily turn it around. They have they keep touting their July first party showcase, um, Halo Infinite. There's going to be obviously other games there, but the disappointment of their third party showcase for me kind of hurt their momentum. I I, I kind of felt like before this event, they were doing a little bit better than Sony and mm. hyping up Series X um, for whatever reason. Sony was just playing it a different way this time. I think now, if Sony does something before July, they can com- They have a chance. They have an opening now. So I would say it moved the needle for me down on Xbox on Microsoft. Um, it hasn't moved a needle on like so- Sony's like still the same, like kind of like a, like a five or something for them. Like I'm just waiting for them to show something. And overall, I think maybe slightly a little bit down. But I feel like when the other stuff starts happening in the next few weeks, it'll probably shoot right back up. Hopefully. Yeah, I um, I slept through the Microsoft announcement, and when I woke up, I was all excited. I was like, "Oh man, what did they talk about?" <laughs> and it, I, you know, I wasn't I wasn't sure uh, kind of the level it was going to be, but just going through the trailers and just seeing the announcements, it it really did not do much for me. Um, and I think right now my current headspace is <laughs> next gen feels like really drawn out in a weird way like it's just a little morsel here and there and we kind of just consume it and then it's like we don't know when the next thing's going to happen and then we get another little morsel but i do think this is all going to go away hopefully um come july uh microsoft has some more things coming up and that's kind of the exciting thing about next gen i feel like is you're only one bombshell away from excitement you're only one bombshell away you're only one game away from everything changing um Because I remember <laughs> the initial Switch presentation and how negative I was during that and really how all of us were after that and just kind of how like, oh no, I don't feel great about the Switch. And now, you know, I love my Switch and I thought launch was super exciting. And so it can it can all turn around very, very quickly, I think. Um, For sure. We got all those things in June. Like the the things are taking place like the week that E three would have been and around it. So, I I yeah I, I think there's gonna be big stuff coming and it'll be just fine. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And with uh you know, I know it's not Microsoft, but with Last of Us and Ghost of Tsushima coming up, I'm still focused on the end of this generation. So like I think once the last of this generation is over then I'm going to start looking like 100% all into the future for the next gen, mm. but preoccupied at the moment. <laughs> um, one thing that I do want to say, and it doesn't really have anything to do with next gen, but I guess it kind of does is like the positives and negatives for gaming during this quarantine is I feel like I've had some time to do things that I normally wouldn't be able to like, I finished Tomb Raider 1 and Code Veronica, and that was a blast, and nice. um, started Final Fantasy XIV back up again, and that's been a blast. But I feel very disconnected from you guys, which sucks. Like, Yeah, dude, I miss you, man. Uh, like, I wish we had a big, like, Streets of Rage 4 group stream, and we were all there in mm-hmm. person. And, you know, that's not even its fault or anything. It's just the way, way it goes. And I feel like just when news is happening, it's not the same just posting it on Slack as it is, like, coming into the studio and talking to you guys and hashing things out, I guess. Just not the same. So I feel Definitely. like all this stuff has inherently less impact for me. 
but definitely. Yeah. yeah. What do you think of Wesker and Code Veronica, Ben? The Wesker Chris showdown at the end. <laughs> yeah, dude. One of my favorite Resident Evil cutscenes, I think. Same. Yeah. Um, I they actually build it up really well too because when Wesker meets Claire, he's just like, "I'm gonna get Chris, man. I'm so pissed off." And then they finally have that showdown. Um, yeah, dude. And it lives up to the hype. I love Code Veronica. Like, so sweet. Definitely some rough edges for sure, but mm-hmm. I think overall it is a an extremely solid, really cool Resident Evil game. Yeah. And I would be way down with uh, like another Chris and Claire team up. Yes. For sure. That'd be awesome. Redfield. Yes. Oh man. <laughs> so I think Resident Evil Eight win. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of. Hype moments. Huber, there's a game. I mean, there's a lot of games that you're looking forward to, but I think one is like maybe just like a couple notches down from Shenmue 3 level. Maybe more than that. I don't know. Let me know. But Streets of Rage 4 finally yeah, came out. And I can't believe it. Yeah. It was <laughs> that game was so weird because I feel like you and myself were like, where is it? Where is it? Oh, it's here. Like, it just sort of <laughs> yeah. showed up. Uh, which is, It was like, oh, we're coming out soon. Right. Here we are. Right. Yeah. Um, but you had the honor of reviewing that, and I know it's something that you've kind of dreamed about for a long time. Uh, and you actually got to play through with it on stream with Michael Damiani, and that was the first yeah. Streets of Rage game that he had played through. So I guess, starting with you, Huber, did it live up to your individual expectations? And then to both of you, what was it like playing together? Dude, 100% it lived up. It it probably surpassed my expectations. What did it need to do to surpass your expectations? To surpass it, just be as good as I remember the originals, mm. you know? Because to me, the originals are timeless classics. They hold up. You can boot them up today, and they're just such a good time. A lot of that is the, the music, of course. The music gets so much love. But just, yeah, the way it feels like the originals but it also feels so modern Mm. just just the balance of nostalgia and history while like making it modern you uh you mentioned the word modern but i'm really Mm -hmm. grateful it's like not modern in a super boring way like there aren't a bunch of rpg mechanics thrown in for no reason totally (laughs) there's like not a bunch of weird combos and counters and parries and but the yeah. yeah, so that I actually I think it might be even better than the classics in some ways, Dude. Um, because the combat is so good. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's the perfect blend of simple. Like you can give it to anybody and they can do basic stuff. But there's a ton of depth there. There's a ton of like all right, like I'm going to stagger out my attacks and then do this particular finisher to get the most damage. And this is when I'm going to use my star moves. Like it's not about the execution. Like that's not that difficult, but just figuring out how like timing works and what the enemies are telling you. Like, and it's like just difficult enough, you know, where it's like, oh, I lost that stage, but now I'm going to be able to dominate it because I've learned so much. And that's a really satisfying cool. process as well. There's, there's such a rhythm to yeah. it. And like mm-hmm. knowing an enemy is like approaching you from behind. And like, you have to be like a couple seconds ahead of everyone. If you really want to get those combos. Like, yeah, I love the scoring system, how you're rewarded so, so much for keeping a combo going, but it's also really risky because you can just lose it all right. Getting hit just once. Uh, just all the weapons, being able to throw it at an enemy and then catch it is so fun. <laughs> like all the stages and, and even the, like the, the, uh, I'm so glad it doesn't have like weird RPG mechanics, but I love the way it handles unlockables, just unlocking all the past characters just by playing the game and getting score. So cool. And the first time you get into one of those retro segments, it's just so yeah. sick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also the boss mechanics, really, really fun. Um, how, like, so far all the bosses that I've fought have really differentiated themselves and have something unique about them. Totally. Um, and how they punish just, like, reckless mashing, but it doesn't feel <laughs> too cheap. It's really, really good. It looks gorgeous. Like, this is a gorgeous-ass game. Yeah. Um, the commissioner, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> the commissioner. Oh, man. <laughs> when also when Adam shows up, it's just like the hypest yeah. shit ever. Um, so hype. 
I don't. I think the music is good. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's quite classic Streets of Rage good. That might just be you know decades of nostalgia working at me. Um, mm-hmm. but I do like it. There are definitely some bopping tracks, but it's just like going up against like Streets of Rage one and two, sure. some of the greatest of all time. Yeah, you know, maybe not. Maybe not I quite think, that level. I think those the old ones are like cover to cover, ten out of ten. Yeah. But this one has a couple tracks that are just like, eh, it's okay. Yeah. But some really good ones, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely yeah. adds a lot to it. <laughs> just, like, breaking out of the prison. And even, like, the shield enemies, how much they change the way that yeah. you approach combat. And, like, teaching you, like, okay, don't get too greedy with attacks. Like, maybe just damage mm-hmm. it a little bit and then go back in or burn your Have super. you fought the judo people in Chinatown? No, not yet. D- those were not giving not Damiani yet. and I, I had quite a bit of trouble. I think I'm at the sewer stage right now. Nice. I've been trying to, the way that I've been doing it is like, I've just been sneaking in like a stage here and there. Nice. uh, Which is nice. Excellent. But I haven't done any co-op, which is a bummer. I really want to do some co-op. I just like match up with somebody random. Yeah. But uh, playing it on PC. Nice. uh, Gorgeous game. Damiani, this is the first Streets of Rage game that you've played through. How do you feel about it? I had a really good time playing through it, honestly. I I dabbled in a few... um, I don't remember which one I played a bit of, but I definitely played one of these before, just a part, like a small portion of it. But I was really so. The thing is, I, I, I agree with everything both of you were talking about about this game. Like its positives and everything it's doing so well. I agree with all of that. Um, I think with this game coming out, I, I think you have to see it in action, actually playing it. Um, at least for me, it had a distinct visual style in all the marketing materials, the trailers. But I was kind of worried. I was like, this isn't sprite art. This doesn't look... I was like, I was like, just a bias of I want this to look more like the retro stuff. This hmm. A lot of these games that come back, they do like this this flat looking aesthetic. And it just... That was what I thought was going to be like the modern take on it. It's, just, it's going to end up looking generic when you actually play it. And I was also worried like how faithful is going to feel in terms of like is the combat going to feel good? Um, is there going to be good enemy variety? Are the bosses going to be good? And I know... People love to throw around names attached to a project, and that's to excite, something to get excited about. But at the same time, it doesn't guarantee it's actually going to pan out to be something good. And it was really nice to see this actually pan out the way um, I think. Like Huber, you seemed so happy when we were playing through it. I could just tell it was like they were. I think that for seeing Huber be so like just smiling constantly, I knew they nailed it for him, and it felt good to me. Uh, I, I feel it was fair. Uh, a little rough at the beginning, like trying to get used to um, handling enemies, and like they keep varying it up. Like kept getting hit by like the knife charging people all the time. Yeah. Even though it looks so slow, it's just like you just deer in headlights. Like, do I jump out of the yeah. way? Can I punch them? Like you, like all these questions you're figuring out as you're playing. And I, I, I think they throw in things at you at a, a great pace that it's like just learn trial by fire. You're gonna get it. It's fine. You're gonna lose a lot, but you're gonna learn. You're gonna get better at this. And by the end, I, I, I felt. I knew what I was doing. I, I felt like I actually, this game taught me how to play it right, and I enjoyed it so much more for that. Also, having Huber with me, you know, to like bail out, uh, <laughs> bail me out on certain situations was great. <laughs> yeah, I agree with the music too. There were a few tracks I was like, yeah, this is nice and stuff. Um, loved Huber dropping that knowledge of uh, this is a so uh, this is a track by so and so, this is a track by one of the original composers. So you know, what was it the final boss fight? Was it was yeah. the last track, and then like the opening level track you were saying? Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. was that was nice to have that kind of guide uh, along through my first playthrough. It added a lot to to the experience. And I have to say, yeah, of all the fighters, like, I didn't get to try everyone. I tried three fighters, tried Floyd, I tried uh, Alex, and then I got to try Adam, and I, Adam was the best. I don't know if he's meant to yeah. be newcomer friendly, but his, their mobility, I don't think they're as powerful, but, like, their mobility, I just loved it. Just being able yeah. to, like, s- s- rush up to people and grab them <laughs> and, and throw them. Like, you were saying, like, the monks taught me oh, you really can, like, abuse the grab. And, like, you were talking about, like, how the game was teaching you, like, you can't, it'll punish you for this, like, b- b- brute forcing, button mashing. 
the game still has a bunch of cheese tactics, which is like what I love of old style games. There are ways to manipulate things, and those shield the, the riot gear people. I don't know yeah. if you picked up what I was doing at the end, Huber. They were non threat to me whatsoever. Do you see what no I was threat? doing? What? They're, they're Did jump. you do the jump thing? You just keep jump kicking through them, yeah. each back and forth, just to keep alternating. Yeah. They don't hit their timing of their hit. Maybe on harder difficulties, they're faster or smarter. But mm -hmm. I loved that when I figured it out because that's that's like be brave. Like, 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 don't sit there and, like, mash, but try something more aggressive and it might work out. I was like, this is, yes, I love stuff like this. Um, the, awesome. the enemy that really messed me up and changed my, like, opinion on how I approach things at the beginning was the, the cop with the taser that would, like, just throw you all the time. Yeah. It would just be like, Grab yeah, you? he was, oh, he's always, like, way faster than I was expecting. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I. I love the little touches in the game. Like I feel like this this project was made with so much love and care, and that's like mm -hmm. evident every single fucking second that you play it. Uh, just like going in and seeing the arcade machines that say "bare knuckle," and you're like, "Okay, yeah. that's." I'm glad you did that, which is a reference mm -hmm. to what Streets of Rage is named in uh, Japan, which is really really cool. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, and those machines also show up in the old games called "bare knuckle" too. Oh, nice. I don't cool. remember that in the yeah. old games. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I really love, and here I'm curious if you agree with this, is the stages are just the right length. Yes. Where it's like they sort of have an idea, they get in, they present it to you, you have a boss, you get out. And it's not like yeah. they go on and on and on and on and become like annoying. Like mm -hmm. it just it just has a really good clip to it, I feel like. Totally. There's a good number of stages. Uh, it's just such a great length, Ben. You're so right. And, and like you were saying, I've been doing kind of the same thing because I've beaten this game like seven times already. <laughs> <I've>, uh, <laughs> I just go through like one or two stages here and there. Yeah. Like, it's just so accessible, so easy to just pick up and play. And just how much it changes, whether you're playing locally or online or single player. Um, cranking up the difficulties. It's funny, Huber, because the reason why I said in a lot of ways I like it even more than the classic beat em ups is, you know, I love, I love good classic beat em ups. I grew up with Streets of Rage 1. I love the original Golden Axe. I love the Simpsons arcade game. Like, I love all that stuff. But it's like something that you kind of have the itch for, and then you play it, and you're like, okay, I'm good for a year or whatever. <laughs> what I like about Streets of Rage 4 is it has that simplicity, but there's also moments where I'm like, oh, I wonder if I can, like, combo into this, or I wonder if I can, like, do this, like bounce him off the wall here and then do so. Like you just get these ideas and you can play around with it a little bit more than you can like a very basic beat em up. And I think totally. just that little bit of extra depth um, makes the hunger to keep coming back even more viable. Like I started with Blaze and then I hmm. moved on to Axel and I just loved this. I love this bearded menace, man. Like, yeah. he's so good. Dude, try Cherry. Cherry is so fun. Okay, she looks really fun. She can, I dig her style. She can run. So you do a double tap and she can run around. Okay. She's really fun. Uh, question. So Axel has this thing where he can get into the air and then roll, like, Sonic style. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. He does the special in midair. Yeah, yeah in mid is, that, yeah. is that a blitz attack in midair? Is that all that is? It's a special move in midair. Oh, so okay. So just when it's you're in midair... Then it's jump plus special. Okay. Is, All right. yeah. Yeah. That's pretty. Yeah. I actually found myself shying away a bit from the special and just trying to do like more stagger combos with the normal attack. Totally. Uh, so you don't, you're not burning through health. I don't know if that's right. For sure. But... Uh, I was using Axel's uh, punch for combos. Like if an enemy is almost dead one hit away, you can still get a bunch of hits in to raise your combo. Nice. It's like overkill. The, doing the like one, two, three, four into blitz attack is just yeah. so good. Yeah. Dude, Damiana and I were doing some pretty wild things co-op, and I'm glad you were, you brought up, like, just how unpredictable and how, like, there is a depth that keeps kind of revealing itself. Mm -hmm. Damiana, dude, it, like, we were accidentally doing some, like, really awesome things. Like, I threw someone across the map, and Damiana just, like, at that moment, like, kick right into Oh, him. that's awesome. Or when we were, like, uh, like juggling one of the bosses. That was, yeah, I, I like that. I mean... <laughs> I'm sure very skilled solo people can do something similar, but the co-op yeah. dynamic, it's, it's just, 
I love how they nailed it. It, it feels fun, but it was still challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I want to praise this game for offering so many different difficulty levels at the start. I mean, I feel like that's always a good thing. And you were definitely made the right call, Huber, cranking it up to a harder difficulty for our first playthrough in co-op because the game's balance definitely accounts for, for, for that in terms of you should bump it up one for co-op difficulty. So like normal yeah. solo is hard for co-op and hard is pr pretty hard solo yeah yeah and i like i felt like felt fair you only had two lives per stage you still had a chance to earn back a life and you know every game over is like we we clearly did something we played bad at this part let's go back and clean that up and i, I like that and the levels never as you said they never felt so long that oh man we really have to go back through all of this again i think and then such a great environment design it's like the elevator part it just looks great, and you can break, break the glass and throw things out, but then now you can be thrown out, but you have the option to try not to break them, which we tried to do on our second attempt. They're like, yeah. let's not break them so we don't get thrown out. And I just like that the environmental hazards, having to keep up with that, <laughs> like mm -hmm. they just keep ramping that up and up, and they throw different types at you. I mean, the elevator glass, puddles of like stuff that acts like a dot on you, so like you're mm -hmm. losing health, you walk through it. I mean, the electricity stuff, that stuff was so annoying. Like the electricity yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's just all <laughs> sorts of cool things they threw at you in each level, and yeah, and then, the, like you said, having secrets tucked in as well, just to, you know, put the cherry on top. Um, I feel like from a design perspective, there's so much good going on here because the the first stage where you can fall through the environment, I was like, man, lives are so precious. Like, if you lose a life just falling through the hole, that's going to be way too punishing. And it's like, oh, no, you like, you lose a good chunk of health. You still don't want to do it, but you don't lose a life. And so it's like this, this feels like a really good balance. I also feel like um, healing items, for the most part, and stars, which are your big, like, ultimate attacks, really well spaced out, where it's like, okay, I don't feel like I'm drowning in these, but I don't feel like they're so far spaced out that it's frustrating, like, just a good level of tension through each short stage, which I like. And, like, try. optional challenges to get more stars. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, in the second level, if you don't advance to the boss right away and you hang around and defeat all the enemies, a star drops mm -hmm. down. I like I like things like that. Right. I think what you're talking about is like a bunch of shield guides though, right? And so it's yes. like, oh, geez. Yeah, so hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, is it worth it? Should we just bounce? Yeah. Like... For sure. Um, yeah. How are you? So Huber, something I haven't really gotten to check out is like extra modes, uh, which I know exists. So what, what do those kind of consist of? What is it like getting unlockables? That sort of thing. Yeah, so the long-term progression is unlocking all the characters, which is really well spaced out. You have to play a bunch of times, and it is phenomenal. You get all the characters, except minus Rue, that not a spoiler. They said the only character you can't get is Rue uh, from Streets of Rage 3. I, I assume it's going to be DLC down the line or something. Uh, but you can get all the characters from Streets of Rage 1, 2, and 3, including Shiva as well from Streets of Rage 3. Uh, and, and again, that'll take a really long time to unlock, like, multiple playthroughs. Uh, and then there's just battle mode, where you can battle each other, one to four players. Just a fun little diversion. It'll be fun when we all get back in the studio and just beat the crap out of each other. Yeah. Um, and then there's just boss rush and arcade mode. Boss rush is standard boss, boss rush mode, where you just fight all the bosses. And then arcade mode is do it all with no continues. So you start with one life. And then any other lives you get, you can earn through combos. Uh, but once it's game over, it's game over. So it's just like a more intense. Cool. And it makes getting those combos even more rewarding and more tense. Because if you have some 80, 90 hit combo, you really don't want to lose that because all those points contribute to your lives. And again, if you run out of lives, it's over. So it's just kind of a, a more intense mode. Can you do the boss rush and arcade mode co-op as well? Yeah. Okay. Nice, 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 nice. Yeah. Um, sweet, man. Like, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't feel like it's happening very quickly, necessarily, but I love <laughs> the start of this trend that Sega is doing where, you know, I feel like they revitalized Sonic pretty successfully with Sonic Mania. I feel like they revitalized Streets of Rage pretty well with Streets of Rage 4. I feel like they revitalized Valkyria Chronicles pretty well with Valkyria Chronicles 4. And I just love the care that they're giving 
to these series. And I, I can only hope that going into the next generation, you know, they get the right teams and the right people uh, behind these projects to keep that going. Um, and I hope financially, you know, it's paying off for them. I hope Streets of Rage 4 does really well because it deserves to do really well. But uh, Agreed. Yeah. Hubert, if you could have one Sega revival right now, what would it be? Uh, it's not Sega, but Sega Genesis, Ben, Rocket Knight Adventures. That's a good pick. I know they had the re- I know they had the reboot like five or ten years ago, that one, but I don't know. Give it like the retro Sonic Mania. G- yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be fun. I I worry that Rocket Knight Adventures doesn't have like the name recognition yeah. uh, to do well, but it would be cool. Or Golden Axe, dude. You said Golden Axe. Oh, man. What was the last one? Like Beast Rider on I actually have never or? played Beast Rider because I've, you know, obviously <laughs> only heard absolutely terrible things. But, yeah, Beast Rider was yeah. the last one. Go, like, Golden Axe, Golden Axe Revival would be so sweet. I think, I actually think there's a lot that you could do with Golden Axe. I think you could do yeah. even, like, a more, like, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance or even Gauntlet style game, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but we've got a lot of curious games here, which I really like. Uh, another one that you guys have been playing t- together, and Damiani, I want you to lead this one, is uh, Dead Rising 2, which you yeah. just finished on stream, I think, right? Yeah, we just did Dead Rising 2, also played through that co-op, Huber and I. Uh, back at Game Trailers, I reviewed the alternate version, the... the uh, what's it called again, Huber? Off the Record. Uh, off the Record, thank you. I can't remember these. There's like case... Like zero case Frank West. Case zero and case West. It's one where you play as Frank West through Dead Rising Two. So it was a Dead Rising prequel and epilogue. Sadly, not part of the remaster. There's a lot of stuff around two. I mean, two. You play as Chuck Green. That's a protagonist. Whereas in the Off the Record, you play as Frank West, and like Chuck Green actually takes the place of one of the crazies you fight. Crazies are the boss fights in these games. These really cool battles they have. So I've played Dead Rising Vanilla, and I did not know he showed up as a like psychopath in off the record that's really cool yeah so (laughs) like the 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 competitor in the beginning of dead rising 2 you have the guy who kind of eggs you on in like the uh the bike zombie killing game that they the the turn the game show they play and chuck green takes the place of that character and then that fight in the game which is kind of interesting but that's it that's all there is to their story and he says he's doing it he does is doing this for his daughter which is katie so the the story is uh Zombie outbreak has happened. Uh, I mean, they've been happening in the world already, and there's a world where you need, like, people have been bitten and don't want to turn, need something called Zombrex. And right. you are doing a latest, uh, this latest game show, you know, it's your job and stuff, and afterwards, a zombie outbreak happens in this place called Fortune City, which is basically like Las Vegas. And you take shelter in this compound with your daughter, and the news story happens, and they're saying you're the cause of it. You you are being framed, basically. So you have 72 hours till the military arrives for a rescue operation, and you have that much time to try and clear your name before they get there, because otherwise they're going to arrest you and things are going to go bad. Meanwhile, your daughter needs an injection of Zombrex every 24 hours, and there are a whole bunch of side quests and survivors you got to try and rescue over the time. So essentially, it's like a big, giant, like, schedule game like think majora's mask where there's a bunch of characters that only appear at certain times and you can only initiate something with them in those time windows and there's a ticking clock and if you miss those windows that's it you you don't know you you lost out and the same time there's no way you're going to be able to make all these do everything on your first playthrough and it takes place in this giant mall slash casino slash shopping center it's like a really cool environment um and we played through it co-op, which is something I hadn't done before. Uh, this is the first one to offer co-op. I know, Huber, you said Dead Rising 1, I think you said is your favorite, but 2 offers co-op, which is something if, if one would offer co-op, it'd be absolutely your favorite. But this one stands out because of the co-op experience. And I think there's something we said about doing it uh, co-op. Because you have always have someone at your back, but at the same time, you're always worrying about your partner as well. So it's like a, it's a constant survivor, basically, but who can fight back with you. And it, it has its pluses and it has its minuses as well. I know Huber specifically, uh, uh, the speed thing. 
Like the yeah. speed thing was one like the most obvious issue was I was a I started as a fresh level level one character. Huber was like whatever level you are, max level or something. So like Huber, you have all these stats you improve as you level up, like attack, speed. You also learn new combos. We'll get into those. Those are crafting things. We'll get into those in a sec. But speed was the biggest one I felt because Huber was able to just run ahead of me, weave yeah. through zombies no problem, whereas I was always Clear left behind. Yeah, I was having to fire, follow the I icon to track down <laughs> Huber half the time. <laughs> um, you know, Huber, I know you said Dead Rising One is your favorite, but Dead Rising Two is a game that I <clears throat> haven't played since it originally came out, but I have such fond memories of, like. It was a game I just devoured, had a blast. I thought it had a really good tone. I really liked Chuck Green. I really liked the like kind of the concessions that they made, I feel like, from Dead Rising 1. I loved uh, the setting. I thought the setting was amazing. And I loved the combo weapons. Uh, did playing through it with Damiani kind of change your opinion one way or the other on it? Or did you stay about the same? The same. I love Dead Rising 2. Love, love, love. Um, I can't say the same really about Dead Rising 3 and 4. I don't I don't love those games. Uh, I think 3 is, is good and 4 I just didn't really like that much. What happened but to I, Dead Rising, dude? Like, how, I don't how did know. it fall so far? I know. It feels like, like they just strayed so far away. Like playing 2 and having like seen a lot of 1, they just kept straying further and further away from these goofy fun games. So when they ended up with four, was, uh, I was like, this doesn't even resemble what I think Dead Rising should be. I, I don't know what the heck happened there. I'm not too familiar with the behind-the-scenes story, but they should have just kept making the same type of game. It, mm -hmm. it was there was fun. always a diversion of, of the fans that loved the time mechanic or hated the time mechanic. I know they were always trying to balance that out. Um, that's why they made off the record and they have the sandbox mode, which is just like, hey, no time limit. Like, Go mm -hmm. run around to your heart's content. I know that's always been a divisive thing, but I, I feel then, like then also didn't it change studios? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I feel like the thing is though, when you just try to please everybody like that, you just make a shittier game. Like I don't know. I, I think it's important for you to think about okay, why are we doing those things? Why do the people that really like it like it? And then how can we make that better? It just felt like it felt like they just watered it down like in an attempt to yeah. get everybody to like it they just made a less yeah. interesting game i agree i um, mean i love the time limit part of it though i mean the game's not so, that long the game is like like maybe 10 hours 10, first playthrough 12, yeah. at best and yeah you, you you will familiarize yourself so much with the, the environments and the schedules that I, I feel it like screams if you really want to see more get more out of it go back and play through again and uh, like you guiding me through to get the true ending here make sure we hit like the right things and i love that there are multiple i mean i knew there were multiple outcomes i just I hadn't played in like what 10 years or whatever and being reminded of that and seeing like the true ending and the twist and stuff <laughs> uh, i was actually i knew it was like i sort of knew it was coming here but i was still shocked when it went down uh the the the, one, the, the, the twist with the uh who, who's one of the villains it's like like my, my jaw just dropped. I was like, uh, that, I mean, this game, it's just goofy and stupid, but it's also fun and awesome. Uh, I love the thing we were talking about when we were sharing our final thoughts in the stream, and I want to reiterate it here. I really love the volume in terms of like the number of zombies present on screen and how it constantly, they escalate the zombie AI to keep them a, a threat to you. At first, you don't like, you're low level, you, you can't really get around them too, I mean, sort of easily. They're not as aggressive, but later on, they get really aggressive because they come, they get story spoiler, we won't get into it, but. You kind of, it kind of tells encourages you to start using your weapons these things these things you fashioned out of all these materials you found in the mall to just fight your way through them like it's, it's a survival game you like just being able to run through them would be a little too it'd take me a little too out of it I feel like and even Huber like getting caught up with his higher stats having to like fight back every now and then I like that I, I was like this is how it should be and I and Adding the fact that you have to like, either guide survivors or get somewhere on time, it adds to that tension. I really, I really appreciate them taking that into consideration and getting that part of it mostly right, in my in my opinion. Yeah, I think Dead Rising does a really good job of like teaching you the importance of what you're bringing into battle, what to use when, all that mm -hmm. stuff is very, very good. I think something about Dead Rising that has always been a weak point for me that 
in my experience, they've never really nailed is just the boss fights. Like the boss fight, there's always like a flimsiness to the boss yeah. fights that never feels quite white. Like it, it feels like it's meant for you to be fighting like hordes of stuff rather than like these yeah. more one on one duels. Yeah, it feels like old GTA jank, combat. Yes, jank. yeah, like, exactly, it's, yeah. exactly. It, it's yeah. like that. That's yeah, why I kept yeah. saying it feels like GTA Hubers. That's what I meant. Is that these boss fights are clearly something that are cool, like a great idea. They just did not do anything to massage that into the the structure they have. They're just like, no, just go at it. Just go at it. We don't care how janky it feels. It's meant to be that way. And it's it's basically like, do you have the right weapon and enough health to survive? Like, you bring the right stuff, you're going to win. There's, like, not really too much strategy to any one of them. The later ones do add secondary things. Like, the helicopter one, you're like, you were obviously pointing them out, but if you didn't use the thing to keep the helicopter blades down, or with the, one of the fights we did, like, moving a crank for a certain reason, you have to go back to it every so often. Those, I, want, I was hoping to maybe see more of those earlier now, that I saw those later. But in general, aside from those gimmicks, it was just, just brute force. If you have the right stuff, yeah, you're forced to win. It yeah, and uh, <laughs> I think they're more for presentation and uh, atmosphere than actually meant to be like an actual challenge per se. Yeah, that's where most of the story comes in, right? Just the like one one where we had to do task was I was was pretty unique. Was that mandatory? I forget that one's mandatory or optional. The the that one's optional. The play one that one was really good. Where you have yeah. to she asks you to do stuff and you need to do those tasks. Mm -hmm. Um. I could see that getting old, though, if they did too many of those. But they, yeah. they, they still found ways to make it work uh, well, well in some cases. Yeah, I I do feel like the psychopaths have an abundance of personality. Like, they're really fun to, like, watch their introductions and just how messed up they can be. So that stuff is really good. There's so much potential in that series. Like, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I dude, hope it has I its was... comeback. Four player. We were we when we were playing on Mike and Mike, we were theorizing a bunch, and I was just imagining like an eight player yeah. co op Dead Rising where you're all just in the mall together and just like yeah. because, surviving. Because you, they give you so many tasks that they just up the amount of tasks you have to do that there's no way you can do it even with like two. You have to break up into teams and stuff, and some mm -hmm. and sometimes you might have to send a partner over. Like we got something, but we need to give it to the other team, so one of us is gonna have to disband and go over there. And Dude, then it goes full Walking Dead, and you can like betray each other. Oh, That'd you're be awesome! Yeah, the good good ideas here. I do. Want, so I mean, fun. the game does have its flaws. We talked. We mentioned a few of them. Uh, it's definitely a product of its time. Uh, all those Playboy uh, covers all over the place. So I was just like, oh, right, right there. We're just doing this, huh? Um, it has sort of the pre uh, Saints Row humor vibe um, that Saints Row kind of like adopted and like kind of ran on, or ran on with uh, after after the series kind of subsided. Um, but I mean, it was. It did not like really detract from anything. It, it's just, it's what I expected out of a zombie game that isn't meant to be scary, but it's meant to be more about the the gore and 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 this like kind of dark humor essentially. Yeah. And it's it's like an action flick. It's basically just trying to be an action flick, and I think they nailed the vibe. Yeah, Ben. I think you you said just there's so much potential, and I just think like. The simple concept of being trapped in a mall right. with zombies and being able to go in all the stores and fashion weapons is just, it's just cool. <laughs> it's just fun. Just that basic, basic concept. So I mean, Super. I think it's, yeah. oh, I think it's something that Capcom has shown they're so good at. I think um, just looking at Resident Evil 2 remake and Resident Evil 3 remake, I think two of the, I think, one of the best aspects of both of those games is going around the city and seeing like the inside of a place or going by that mm -hmm. toy store and seeing all the references and stuff. And that kind of mentality, like an RE engine dead rising yes, in like yes, a yes. theme park yeah. or something would be amazing. Like you could, they would have so much fun with it. There'd be so many things to discover. It'd be really exciting. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, think, so much um, potential. Dead Rising, even Dead Rising one remake in in RE Engine. We were talking about that. Yeah. It'd be great. Um, uh, for both of you, because you probably know the answer. To this did three or four or any subsequent like follow up content do like territorial stuff where you can 
hold an area maybe and there's like less zombies but other areas get overrun like is there any of that like dynamic going on i'm thinking about like maybe a more strategic angle where if you set up like blockades put resource like in like resident evil you like board up the windows and stuff what if they you put resources into developing defense strongholds in certain parts of the mall or an area is there anything uh, like that in four it was about like getting your exoskeleton suit together that was a big deal. You had to like kind of go around the mall and get parts for your mech suit because that thing was like pretty essential for some of the, the harder parts. But that's the only like persistent defense I can think of. And okay, so didn't do anything forgot. like that. That's fine. I uh, I reviewed three for game trailers and I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. I, I, don't, I mean, I don't I, think so. I don't think so. Um, I but I like that idea. I. Hesitate, though, because then I think that leads down the, like, gather wood and stuff, and it's just, (laughs) I don't know, I think it could be, like, a very basic type of foraging that wouldn't be super satisfying, but if done well. Yeah, because then it would be, what's the game on Xbox? Save Decay. Yeah. Save the Decay, yeah, yeah. yeah, now it's, then it's, like, I get get your point, because the real, I I think one of the best draws of Social Dead Rising 2 is, we were talking about the, the the crazy combo weapons you can make. Yeah, exactly. And Hubert is showing me like these new recipes, basically uh, starting with like like monk claws, like boxing gloves with like knives and stuff, to like a helicopter that like just chops everything up and then blows up remotely, <laughs> and like Blanca head that can do electricity. And I was like, this, yes, like yeah. just more crazy ideas like this. I, I think it just needs whatever that direction is. Go more in that direction if you ever come back to Dead Rising, guys. Like, can you even imagine what a new Dead Rising? Some of the weapons they ha- would have yeah. a freaking Monster Hunter great sword. Oh my god! Just hanging out in the toy store, Ben. <laughs> just <laughs> seeing just like, like Frank West do dude. a true charge slash, just like whoosh, <laughs> whoosh. Yes, yeah. Dude. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Friggin' some Resident Evil guns, dude. You get like, like oh. you get like ebony and ivory, and just go. Yeah. yeah. It would be amazing. That, like. <laughs> I don't know. I but what makes Dead Rising one and two so good is it, it they they have teeth, you know, like there is that that tension with the time and the objectives and what you choose to do. Um, and I think Huber, you were saying, especially with Dead Rising four, like it just feels like nothing matters. Like it's just kind of mindless yeah. in a in a bad way. I guess mindless is inherently bad, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I. I hope it comes back. I get the hope they get the right people to to do it. I think there's a lot of potential. I know people are burned out on zombies, but I think that's something that's yeah. so special about Dead Rising is it really does feel distinct and different from all of the other zombie and zombie survival type games out there. Totally. Um, and it's it's you know it makes me always appreciate sequels and and when a game turns out well you know because i'm thinking now this franchise is in kind of a similar situation to dead space you know dead space had was strong out of the gate had phenomenal games one two and even extraction and then dead rising three came out and we haven't had a game since so well dead rising or um dead space three is kind of the same thing where it's like everything that every direction that you're pushing for in dead uh dead space three is not what made the first two games so special. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I just want more third-person, good third-person survival horror. Is that yeah. such a hard ask? Like, <laughs> I feel like Resident Evil does so well, and there, there are these properties out there that could do so well if they just make them good. I don't know. Yeah. It's yeah. frustrating. That, it's hard. I think Dead Space has even more potential than Dead Rising. Like... What a phenomenal series that just completely evaporated into nothing. It's it's in, a an, crime. in an instant. Yeah. You know, it's sad. Yeah. Um It's alright though, we'll always have one and two. Yeah. I for both of those franchises. Yeah. The, Dead Space Remaster. We still need it. Yeah. <laughs> Dead Space Next Gen. Yes. That is Could be that, such a showpiece. Could be such a showpiece. <sighs> yeah. Like Welcome to our lighting, dude. Here, here we have arrived. <laughs> I want to hear Mark Cerny say that in his Mark Cerny. Uh, welcome to our lighting. <laughs> um, what's not a disappointment, though, is Persona 5 Royal, <laughs> oh. uh, which I've been streaming. And I feel like I've put 
like <laughs> I feel like I, I'm still just scratching the surface, even though I think I've put like 12 or 16 hours in something like that. Um, so there's a lot of new stuff that I haven't seen. I haven't seen a lot of Kasumi, the new character yet. Um, haven't obviously done the extra semester, but going into this game for as much as I like Persona 5, I was a little bit nervous because I think it can be hard summoning the motivation to go through really long games again, where part of what's keeping you on the hook is you don't know these characters. You don't know the story. You don't know the mystery, right? So knowing a lot of that ahead of time, I was really worried and I've been having a phenomenal time. And I think it speaks to both the, the original quality of Persona 5 and the improvements that Royal is making. Um, there are just so many th things that make just engaging with the game more fun, even just like the looseness on not having to go to bed as uh, strictly <laughs> as before <laughs> changes so much. Um, there are new things to find in a dungeon. There are like these seeds that you can find, so exploration is more fun. Um, there are combat changes. Like I just did the Kamoshida fight again, and he has like this totally different phase and mechanic uh, that completely changes the battle and it asks you to make a decision. Like, do you want to go after this or this? And wow. like, yes, a lot of it is of course still Persona 5, but I feel like, you know, at a fairly consistent clip, there's some new thing that's hitting me and giving me a deeper appreciation for something that I already loved. Um, and yeah, yeah go ahead, Damiani. I was say, that's really good to hear. Um, that's one of the things I always, it's always expected that these enhanced ports are just gonna add on like new features and maybe some quality of life stuff. But the ones actually go back and rework existing stuff to do exactly what you just said, like change up a boss fight, like adding like a new thing, new phase, right. new whatever that you haven't seen before. Like I think that goes such a long way towards encouraging and like motivating people to keep playing through who already played through it once because now they're like oh what other new stuff are we going to be seeing and stuff like it's it's something subtle or not subtle sorry it's something small enough but exciting enough that i i want I, 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 that's my take on it from what you said that now you're probably gonna be looking forward at to future boss encounters and be wondering what is the new like do something new here do i have to figure it out like i mean is that the vibe you now have with it Sorry, can you repeat that question? Oh, the question is, I mean, from what you've seen, what they've done differently to existing oh, like, sure, sure, combat sure. and stuff, you, does it feel like it's now encouraged you, made it easier to replay through this game, this long game you've already replayed, because yeah. you said it was a, kind of like hard to motivate yourself to go through such a long game again on a second playthrough. Oh, yeah, yeah. I feel like my, my feeling has completely transformed, where... Um, I was nervous and reluctant because it's like, ah, you know, I, <laughs> this is, let's say a hundred hour commitment. Do I want to do that 100 hour commitment again when there are all these other games that I've never played before or haven't finished, you know, would it be better to do that? And it really doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like I'm wasting my time. It feels like I really am just having a deeper appreciation for Persona 5. I think playing on the merciless difficulty is also adding to that feeling quite a bit um, because it's completely changed um, the difficulty of boss fights. Like during that Kamashita fight, during the new mechanic, I made the wrong decision and my entire party got wiped out in one attack. And it's like, oh, first boss, holy shit. And so that was fun because if I was just playing on normal again, you know, I wouldn't have had the, the struggle that I'm having. Um, and it's changed uh, regular encounters too. Like it's hard because like weaknesses are amplified. And so either you take a lot of damage or you deal a ton of damage, which is hard to weaken enemies to the point where you can hold them up and capture them. So it's changed that dynamic as well. Um, but I think the thing that I really appreciate with new additions like this, uh, another thing that you worry about is it doesn't, you don't want it to ruin what was already good. And it really doesn't. Mm. Um, I feel like everything that I liked is just kind of getting puffed up a little bit. And there are just these little things on the sides that keep cropping up. It's like, it's like somebody took a, like a really, like a surgical blade and they were just like, this could be better. Let's snip this out. Like it, it just feels a, like a very well considered re-release that, 
like I, I think if you weren't that big of a fan of Persona 5, right, if you didn't like it or you burned out on it or whatever, I don't think this is going to change your mind. But I think if you did really like the original game, you'll probably be surprised at how much you're enjoying Royal uh, as well. So, yeah, I, I definitely recommend it. Go the ahead. Stuff, I was going to say the stuff in between. So outside of the, the dungeons and, and mm-hmm. combat stuff, um, you mentioned that they, they've refined some things. I wonder, I'm curious, in your opinion, has that been a... Has that made it facilitated beyond i mean beyond just facilitating getting through like the daily activity stuff have they uh, have yeah. they done anything else or do you feel like doing it again does it feel still enjoyable to you um or do you, because you know a lot of the information ready does it just does feel kind of still like going through the motions or is there still like are you still getting pleasure out of the stuff in between uh yeah having knowing how all the outcome stuff already is um, so this isn't going to be true for everybody. I think if you are somebody that did absolutely everything in OG Persona 5, you might get less out of it. But what makes what's part of what's making Persona 5 such a fun game to replay is... And it's kind of the Royal Edition being looser with your time. And so you can, you can do more stuff in a given day, which is really nice. And also, like, there are a bunch of things in my initial playthrough that I didn't get to see all the way. So it's like, oh, I didn't max out that confidant, so now I'm going to invest in this. Because, you know, in your initial playthrough, you're not as skilled knowing how to optimize your time or what things to go after. And so it's like the best of both worlds, where it's like there are storylines I haven't seen all the way through. Now I'm going to see them all the way through. And also, I have the knowledge of this is good, this is bad, this is what I should do. And so I feel like days feel new because I know where to focus. Like, it's like, oh, I didn't do that thing. I'm going to spend more time there or whatever it is. So, yeah, I think if you're kind of in a similar position where you're like, oh, I maxed out these confidants, but I didn't really see these guys at all, or there were just activities that I didn't really engage in or didn't know about, like, that's kind of the thing about Persona 5 is there are so many ways that you can spend a day. It's like... Oh, it's after school. Let me just, you know, check PSN to see what everybody else did. It's like, oh, I have, you know, half a dozen options or 10 options of all these different things that I could do to either like increase my own stats or make myself better in battle or just get further along a storyline. There's just so much to see um, that replaying it has been really rewarding, if that makes sense. Um,. I know both of you played through Persona 5, and both of you liked it quite a bit. Damiani, you streamed your initial playthrough of Persona 5. Uh, have, do you guys have any desire to return to it? Or Oh, a million percent. Are, does, does Royal sound enticing enough for you? Absolutely. Uh, I love replaying non-re-releases. <laughs> um, I, I absolutely love, love, love replaying my favorite video games. Um there's just such a comfort in it there. I love just really ingraining it into my brain and my heart and my soul. And I feel like that is not possible for me personally, unless I, you know, play it more than once. Uh, so it's awesome to hear that all of these changes just make the game even better. Mm -hmm. Like it it doesn't take much for me to want to replay, play a game I love so much. And Persona 5 is easily one of my favorite games ever made. So I just, I can't wait to play this, Ben. Uh, it, it's funny how, like, even small changes, because, the, again, that initial quality is so good, it just adds so much. So, like, just revisiting the soundtrack, it's like, I've heard some of these songs yeah. so many times, I'm still not sick of them. Like, they're still <laughs> banging tracks. And so getting, you know, some new tracks mixed in there as well that are pretty much just as good as the rest of the soundtrack is such a treat. Um, yeah. and from a presentation standpoint, like <laughs> I wish more games could, could be so distinct in their style. Like even just going to the gun shop and having like that neon green menu or going to Oops. the doctor and having her spin around in the menus. chair before that blue menu <laughs> pops up or the after battle, like running along as like the, the experience is flying by Joker and the level up pops and stuff. It's just like, 
and and even the dungeons like the d- d- dungeons are so distinct like the first dungeon you are breaking into a castle you are hiding behind objects you're ambushing people you're stealing treasure you're jumping along chandeliers like i know people criticize it for being so long but i feel like the quality of the presentation and the care put into the activities that you're doing make that time just like melt into nothing. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really really fun, as well. Um, but Damiani, do you feel a desire to replay at all? The ori- when I originally finished it, I, w- I mean, Persona games always have all the other the choices that you know you didn't make, the things left right. unsaid, and there's always this small yearning at the very least to go back and see the what ifs. And I did feel that at the at the end of Persona Five the original playthrough, the part like I wanted to start playing through again. I'm like, oh, let me just see. Like I know everything. Let me do it while it's fresh. But at the same time, uh, this might make it more realistic for me, or uh, might incentivize me to jump back in at some point to to do those what ifs and play a different way and make different choices. Because uh, while I do agree mostly with what you said about the game. Mm. Um, I do feel, I do feel its potency for me personally wore off towards the end because sure. it is such a long game, and I it so and I've come to reconcile that, but it's not necessarily the game's fault so much as it's really hard to make anything as compelling as that for like an eight hour eighty or whatever. That right. and at some point things are gonna become so familiar no matter what cool visuals they're doing that it's just you start to things start to you you see the patterns. You see like the you start to have expectations and they're being met on that level. And I'm specifically talking about the dungeons. And I think it's like the last two traditional dungeons were the not were the tipping point for me where I kind of lost it with the game i was Mm. like i want to get to the end now can i just go to the end so i'm very curious you talked about these changes they made i wonder if they dared to try and do anything on those later dungeons i know you're not there yet so you can't answer this but i'm very curious to see uh if they did anything to later dungeons even to like because these are so late let's do a few things to spice these up even more so that people when they get to this point they still feel as invigorated as they did like in the first few dungeons because i think that was the thing that kept it from pushing it over the top for me that i was like i loved every moment of this game it was like three-fourths of that game i mostly loved playing through and love it and then it's just the the just being so long at the end it was just sure. its own worst enemy because of that and it's it's just yeah it's just i don't know what to do with this like i would have taken this game being 20 hours shorter but then again there were people who throw it right back at me and said there's some people when we play this game we are having such a great time we don't want it to end like we get right. to that part where like we want 20 more hours of this and i absolutely feel about that way about other games too so i i do see that point of view um, Damiani, you bring up a, a really good point, um, and you're making me think like, you know, I should be more careful saying that because, uh, even in the original Persona 5, like the part that I'm playing through in Royal, I also really, like the whole Kamoshida storyline in the original was definitely a highlight of the game for me. So I don't know if it won't feel long in the tooth as I get further in, especially since I've seen a lot of this stuff. And I don't know if, you know, the new section at the end will feel Mm. egregious or too long. Um, All I can say is that right now, you know, time is melting away, but you know, in another 20 hours, I could be like, Oh God, I'm sick of this. So that, that could definitely happen. I think there's other like unsaid factors in that though, as well too. It's like, what is, what do you, playing on the side what is what is where are you in your life right now like what is your backlog what games are coming out so i think just like the timing of replaying a game is also really important that can make it feel longer or shorter i'd also add i don't think anyone's feeling any shame in like or obligation if you jump back into this and say like just like ben's been saying what they played early on they have a blast with it i think there's no shame in like if you especially already played it before stopping and not finishing Mm -hmm. P5 Royal. It's just like play like 20, totally. 30 hours, be like, this was really good. I just needed to be reminded of how good this was. And yeah. it was great. I mean, it's a little shame. I don't know how far away they took some of the first significant new content. I don't know if it's really well, far. It's, out. The, it, it's kind of hard to explain because there is okay. like a new semester at the end, but they also 
introduce a new character immediately and kind of sprinkle her in throughout the story. That would be like the only shame is that you don't get to experience the meat right. of the new stuff. Right. And I kind of wish, especially for people who already played the original, I mean, you bought the game, you got the sale atlas, like allow like a save transfer, like just an option. Hey, did you play the original? Would mm -hmm. you just like to jump to the new thing just to try it out? Like, I'm going to throw this to a game coming out uh, at the end of the month, Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, where they're giving you the option to just, hey, have you already played the original game? We got this new epilogue that's standalone. Would you just like to play it right away? Yes, you can just go to it. Now imagine yeah. if that was tucked behind 70, 80, 100 plus hours of Xenoblade before you could get to that. I, they I, actually I, I, did that with Persona 3 FES, where you could yeah. just play the the new chapter so um, i i, I kind of like that flexibility so if there's one fault i'm not looking for faults but if there's a fault to find from everything i've heard and seen it's that i wish there was an option to have your fill uh, and then but also be able to jump to the new stuff if you wanted to if you've already put in the time before obviously if you're a new yeah. person let them tell them you should probably play the game as intended first before you jump to the new stuff yeah i I totally get that, and I think that is a very good point to bring up. I think the argument against that is how they introduce this character, where it's like, hey, we spent an entire game, you know, because she is she is sprinkled in throughout the story and, like, is introduced in a certain way. Like, we have gotcha. to present it this way rather than, you know, just putting it at the end. But maybe even having that option... Uh, would entice some more people. It's an interesting thing to think about, for sure. Yeah, you, for sure. You, your point does illustrate, like, it's not as... The, the design philosophy they went with this, it's not probably as simple as that. They, you'd have to cut out some of the, like, the work and the narrative they put in to set up for that new content. So it would be... You know, going against like creator's intent on that. I know you love that, Huber. Like, it's not, it's not respecting the creator's intent. But at the same time... I guess maybe it's a message to developers to maybe consider that when you are making a game. I, I do appreciate the developers who do consider your time is valuable, especially if you're a returning customer who's already put so much time into your your, your game and your, your, your work of art that, hey, maybe respect us a little bit too and meet us a little bit halfway and say, uh, like, j you can jump into this. I respect that decision as well. Yeah, I I don't know. I I I feel like um my love for this game, this re-release Huber is also hinging on the fact that I'm stuck at home. Like I wonder if things were normal if I would even have time to play through this and if I would feel just completely different. Totally. But I'm in such an RPG mood Partly because I feel like there's more time to just kind of sit in and soak in it and take it slow uh, than there than there normally would be, but yeah, uh, Damiani, I'm I'm actually going to be really interested with Xenoblade Definitive Edition, where like the people who jump in and just start with the epilogue, how much like how easily they're able to jump in or if like the story yeah. will start going and it'll be like wait what what's going on like i wonder how well it will catch up new people or not I, new people but returning people i returning yeah people. i mean the, i think the only people who are going to do that are people who are really invest in the lore mm -hmm. of xenoblade and don't want they just want to play it before it can be spoiled or something but otherwise i don't really understand i mean it's a nice consideration for this but for I still feel like because they're advertising, they're changing so much about the game, like quality of life stuff. It's such a can it apparently be such a significantly different experience. It's like on, on that on that surface level that you'd want to at least dive into the normal game first to get acclimated to all that stuff, and right. then maybe find a nice spot to save, and then let's jump into uh, Future Connected and, and go from there. Uh, Damiani, this was not. The demons were actually going to let us go unchecked, but then you said a phrase that just pissed them off so much. <laughs> the demons hate creator's intent. They hate it. They do not, they do not respect the creator's intent. They say, fuck the creators. <laughs> I think the demons are the ones leaking everything online. It's a mess. Uh, so we are unfortunately caught in a frame trap. And today, the game is going to be... <laughs> Is this a Switch port or not? So I'm going to give you a list of games, and you're going to tell me if this is a Switch port that actually exists 
or it is not. Gotcha. Um, are we ready to go? Sure. Fire away. Okay. I'm going to have you both answer, and I'm going to tally up uh, whoever gets it right, and then whoever has the most points at the end wins. The first one, is there a switch port of Neverwinter Nights? No. I'll go with no. Yes, there is. All right. What? Yeah. Sick. Fallout 4. No. No. Correct. There's not a switch port of Fallout 4. One for each of you. Dragon Quest 4. No. Isn't it? I'm going to say yes. Huber pulls ahead. There's Dragon uh, Quest 1 through mobile. 3. Oh, it's 1 through 3. And 11. I, was like, I couldn't remember what the four. numbers were for that. Oh, damn it. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sonic CD. No. Wait. No. Oh, it doesn't feel right. Is there a Switch port for Sonic CD? Is My it, gut says yes. My gut tr- says yes. I'm trying, I'm, going to, yes. I'm trying to remember if there's a Sonic collection on this. Switch. Sonic CD. Uh, uh, I'm gonna guess yes. I feel like collections on everything. I should know this. You're both wrong. Damn it. Uh, Dude, Sonic CD is on God. many things, but not on Damn Switch. It. Trust your instincts. Yeah. All right, last one. Virtual Racing. Yes. Yes. You're both correct. It's a Sega Ages release. Yeah. Virtual Racing. All right, uh, Huber, you you eked ahead there, three to two. Uh, You got him on Dragon Quest. That's what you got him on. (laughs) Uh, So you will be the one to break us out of the frame trap. But before we do that, think of how you want to get us out. Before we do, before we get into any breaking out nonsense, and hopefully I don't forget, uh, we're going to shout out our wonderful shout out to your patrons, which is a two hundred and fifty dollars tier on patreon.com slash easy allies. Go there if you want to find out more. Uh, and yeah, basically we just shout you out on every podcast that we have, and uh, we try to make it kind of fun. So for this for this shout out, I'm going to say the name, and we're going to start out really really low with the shout out, and with each progressive shout out we're gonna get a little bit louder okay mm-hmm. first shout out blue shout, shout out. out caleb togi crawford shout, shout out. out l thanis shout, shout out. out greg the dark knight kettering shout, shout out, out. Last one. Jesse Blue. Shout, Shout out. All right. Huber, have you thought of a way to break us out of the yeah. frame trap? I'm going to cast Libra on the demons, and then I'm going to write their names in the death note. <laughs> <laughs> so we have like a multi-part <laughs> breakout. We have a spell yeah. cast and a death note. I love yeah. this ingenuity, Huber. <laughs> <laughs> My new headcanon is that somehow you've manipulated the powers of the Death Note to make video game releases happen. Like, you've had to selectively kill people to make certain games come to fruition. Be careful, yeah. Huber. Did you read the, the one-shot follow-up? Never using a Death Note never goes right, man. You gotta be careful, oh, even when you think know, you got dude. it right. Dude, the Death Note is like time travel, man. It's not worth it. Don't use it. <laughs> All right. Get us out of here. Wait, you didn't already do it, did you? Fuck. <laughs> it's really weird that you wrote Brandon Jones in that, in that <laughs> notebook. Hubert, <laughs> why have you been playing Dark Souls 2? Dude, I don't know, <laughs> Dark Souls man. 2. I don't know. Because uh, a couple months back, I went through Dark Souls 1 mm-hmm. remastered. Mm-hmm. Oh, yep. yeah, I remember he's talking about that, yeah. And it seemed like you and, had a blast. Yeah, dude. It was phenomenal. And you know I love replaying games. What build did you do in Dark Souls 1? Halberd. Nice. Love the Halberd. Absolutely. Great one weapon. of my favorite video Yeah, one of my favorite video game weapons of all time. Dark Souls 1 Halberd. Um But Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, 2, th- and 3, and even Sekiro, I've only finished one at- time ever. 
uh, Bloodborne, of course, finished three or four times, get that platinum. But all the other ones, I only finished once. And that's what... And I had never played any of the remasters. So I was like, dude, what do you... I'm like craving it, got the itch. Have to replay Dark Souls because uh, I think another part that prompted me to do it was... Uh, really in my heart thinking that Sekiro has just the greatest combat in video games ever. So I wanted to go back and, and revisit Dark Souls and kind of compare the combats. Next thing I know, I'm obsessed with the game and lore and everything, and I'm, I just fell down the rabbit hole. And then uh, just because of the quarantine, like you were saying, Ben, just having so much time on our hands mm-hmm. uh, to, to really soak in a game, I figured never played Scholar of the First Sin version of Dark Souls 2, and and I'd played all the DLCs of all the games, so it's, I've, I've played it all before, but uh, not this Scholar version that has the extra NPC. So I've just been enjoying the ride, man. I've been seeing the lore differently. Uh, you know, I can't wait to talk to Ian about it Have all. Have you just... fallen down a Vati video hole? Not Vatya Vidya, but uh, Fextra Life or whatever. Their their like lore stuff, stuff, all that stuff. Like I'll I'll do it usually after I get through an area or beat a boss, mm. and I'll kind of like think about it for a bit, and then I'll be like, okay, what is their their interpretation? Such a nice of little it? reward as you're going throughout the yeah. game. Yeah, yeah. It's ju- I'm just having such a good blast, and also again, you know, it's part of the quarantine, of course, and part of the quarantine. You know, I'm, I always, you know, guy, I love co-op guys and, and social gaming and with the quarantine, because I haven't been able to see anyone, you know, multiplayer has been even more of a priority for me. Um, and going through the first dark, going through souls for your very first playthrough, some of those invasions and stuff can be kind of like, not, not a distraction, but just like. Leave me alone, <laughs> players. You, you know you already feel like you're you. on the edge, and it's like pushing you over. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And now, now because I'd beaten the game before, and just because of of quarantine and missing social interactions, mm-hmm. it's like I'm just really enjoying everything that this game has to offer. Whether it be going through an area by myself, summoning a random uh sun bro <laughs> that helps me on a boss fight or getting invaded like the other night someone kept in uh pulled me into that area where they can set up traps it's like under the rat covenant area and this guy summoned me like two times and we had just like the first time he killed me right at the very end and then like 10 minutes later he summoned me again and i i got him and then i we didn't get to settle it for a third one but just like the fact that we're, we're like people are playing Dark Souls. Yeah, that's what right I was going to bring up. Getting... I'm surprised how active <laughs> this is for sure. Yeah. yeah. So just all the elements of this game, mm. I've just been getting lost in it, and it's just such a such a joy. Hubert, it's weird because Dark Souls Two is is such an odd duck where there are yes. there are really cool things and there are ideas that mm-hmm. I wish they emphasized a little bit more in follow-up games. And I think what they do with Covenants is really cool, and, or at least what they're trying to do with Covenants is really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, in my opinion, it's still the weakest of, of, the, of the series. Um, have you had a greater appreciation for it, revisiting it? or I appreciate it a lot more, for sure. Is, are there things that are uh, surprising um... you? The lore, I think, mm. and the world. I'm just like so much more invested than I ever have been with the Dark Souls lore. Maybe because I understand it now more than I did back then. Mm. Um, I will say, absolute weakest link of Dark Souls 2. And to me, the main reason, there's two main reasons, but the main, main, main reason it's the weakest link out of all of them is the boss fights. Yeah. It has by far the weakest bosses of the entire Soulsborne series um they just feel like normal enemies a lot of them are so boring and have such mundane attack patterns and yeah a lot of them don't stand out i will give a shout out to the mirror knight though yeah the mirror knight is a highlight that was awesome um if you if you're unfamiliar with the mirror knight he slams down the shield and can summon another player that can break out of the shield and fight you yeah um so cool it's so freaking isn't cool. it during that fight there's like a storm happening as well yeah 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 it's a good fight really good fight you're right though there were so many bosses been playing through dark souls 2 and it was like oh oh that's it 
Just a normal enemy. <laughs> okay. I do think with the health bar. that's something they, they improved pretty dramatically with the DLC, uh, but the, yeah. base, the oh. base game, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. The DLC actually has maybe my favorite of all time, and that's Sir Alone. Mm. Uh, that's, that's one of my favorites. Can't wait to get there. I'm getting close. I'm near the end. Damiani, have you played Dark Souls 2? No, I was about to say, yeah, that... Uh, I mean, it's good to hear Huber speaking positively about some aspects of the game and that there are still, like, at least one or two boss fights, you know, that you find very, you know, high up there. But when I hear most of you, the, the, you as the allies, who've talked about Dark Souls 2 in the past, um, mm -hmm. well, they're, they're definitely, like, positive you, you, you've mentioned. For the most part, it's been impressed upon me that's the one I need to could just do without i could avoid that one so i've never really felt the need to go and play it for whatever reason um specifically because i'm just hearing all the things i heard about it were just it's the weakest in the series you're better off playing the other ones so my priority these this was a really hard series for me to get into to, be, to begin with mm. uh, i tried to play demon souls got turned off by it uh tried dark souls Thought it was like okay, then revisited it, got into it, and actually finished it finally. And I was like, okay, uh, I'm like, it was like this really lengthy process. And then two came out, didn't hear good things at first. And I was like, mm, maybe I'll stay away from it. And then Bloodborne came out, and it, the, like everything I saw about, it, I loved about Bloodborne more than anything I'd seen in any in Demon or Dark Souls games. And that's like my favorite. And then Dark Souls three came out. And I was like, uh, maybe I'll try that at some point. So I haven't touched two, haven't touched three. And of the those two, I'd rather, from everything I've heard, I'd probably go play three. three dude. I'd absolutely yeah. go play three and be, and be satisfied never next. touching two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which which is unfortunate. Yeah. I feel like that's kind of that's like an Arkham Origins situation. I know that the tides have turned with Arkham Origins, but I feel for the, like for the longest time, people were like, ah, I don't really need to play it. Spin off, not rock steady. And it's like, oh, it's so unfortunate because like Dark Souls Two is the worst one by far, but it's still phenomenal. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's that's an interesting thing because I think that's the on my on my end. That's the misconception I have. Is that while in your heads as you're you're talking about these games, to you it's still a fantastic, it's a really good game. Yeah, but really when good. talking within it in the scope of Soulsborne, you like to put mm -hmm. all these criticisms, so it comes off as being sounding a little harsher than maybe it really yeah. is, and right. so that impresses upon someone like me yeah. that hmm. So yeah, you can, I hope you see that it comes across that way to an average person like me, where totally. that's why. Yeah, my mind's made up that mm, this is probably not that good. So it's really hard for me mentally to get prepared to try and play Dark Souls too. Like I need a lot of convincing reassur uh, reassurances, uh, especially to try it first over like three because I haven't played three exactly. either. Yeah, if, and if time is a factor, of course I would be like, yeah, just play three, just just play three. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, yeah. Also, one last note of, uh, you know, just one of my favorite things to do is just playing, replaying games. Not only replaying games, but kind of the combination of replaying a game after the fact. There's less noise. There's less pressure. Yeah. It feels like you're kind of just playing it in a safer space. <laughs> um, That's actually I something that, that, very well. <laughs> that applies with the Persona 5 Royal review as well. Um, where, like, playing diff games in different settings can allow you to appreciate some things more than others. Like, um, not playing Persona 5 for review and being like, not feeling that like, oh God, I got to get the script out, uh, I think has also added to the enjoyment of it. And even like, it's interesting because streaming games sometimes, having chat there, they help me appreciate things that I probably wouldn't appreciate as much on my own. But then, you know, and this isn't an insult to chat. It's just chat can also be distracting. And so it's like, oh, not streaming a game will maybe allow me to get more into the story or, you know, whatever, some small detail or whatever it is. Different vibes. Different, for different sure. vibes. Yeah. So there, it's just <laughs> like I, there are, there are huge positives and negatives to both things. And it, I, when you talk about replaying games, I think doing it in different environments um, really helps you appreciate kind of all sides of something. For sure. Um, Damiani, you guys, for Stream Team, you guys played a game called Moving Out. Wait, did I play that with you? 
you? No. What was the game that Good Job is what we played? Good Job. Good yeah, Job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simil- yeah. They're similar, similar vibes there. Um, what What is Moving Out? So Moving Out is you are a uh, one to four player game where you're, it feels better to play co op, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I haven't played solo, but I can't imagine it not being as fun um, or being more fun than playing with other people where you're a moving company and you have to go to these, you have a world map with these, uh, uh, top down view of these homes and businesses and you go they're like stages and each stage you go to you have a job and you have to move out uh, these uh, objects within the house furniture trinkets whatever um, and you have a time you don't have a time limit where you fail you have time limit in terms of like you earn gold silver bronze or just no ranking and then uh it, it's two parts. It's figuring out which items you got to... Uh, it's, it's more than two parts. Uh, you got to figure out what items you're moving out of the house first. Uh, you got to figure out paths. And it's not as simple as go like in a house. Like Let's start with the house concept. It's not as simple like going through the hallways, going through the front door. You break glass, go through windows. You can like find like there's slopes. Maybe like it's a, a house on a hill. Maybe you can use a slope. Maybe it's like a snowy area so you can slide mm-hmm. down snow. Uh, and then even your moving van, uh, part of it is it only has finite space. So you got to fit everything in there. So however many objects you're supposed to move, you you have that space. It kind of becomes a little bit of like a Tetris type thing where you got to put things in at a certain angle and stuff like that. And then there are object and uh, objects you're moving can either be moved by yourself, uh, can be need two people to move them. Um, there's fragile objects, so like you can't drop them. Otherwise, you have to go back. Anything that gets destroyed, you got to go back to its original spawn point, bring it back, and then. Levels become increasingly more complex. They start adding uh, adverse conditions, um, like oil slicks. Uh, we talked about snow. Some you have to cross a moving street. There's literally a level that is an homage to Frogger, where it's just a vertical up, and there's even frogs moving across, and you got to like move across like the logs, the alligators, all that stuff, avoid the traffic, going kind of cross. Nice nods like that. Um, to a Luigi's Mansion level where there's a ghost that, that's like follow you and try and like scare you and capture you. Uh, and wreck your day and stuff like that. But you can, instead of using some kind of like ghost uh, proton pack, you just slap them. You can slap ghosts. And that's how you like knock them away and keep them at bay. Uh, so yeah, it, it's just it, it's just crazy. Everything you t- run into just gets moved and like obstructs you. So it's just meant to be chaotic. You can like stretch your arms to like elongate a bit to like make it through like narrow areas. You can toss things. So like, it sometimes is effective to go up to a multi-story building and toss things out the window. But sometimes they're fragile, so the person below has to catch them or they break. Uh, and yeah, just striving for uh, the better time. It, just, it felt really... It, it, we really, as a group, like we're just pushing ourselves like, hey, we got to get that gold. And we didn't get like one... We got. I don't even think we went back and redid the first level to get the gold, but... Uh, yeah, like it, it, every time you pe- miss a milestone, it's like, hey, don't worry, this is the next one. But like, we won like silver bus most of the times, and it's still le- le- like the levels unlock in linear fashion. But you don't have a choice of where you're going. But like, they open up all over the map, so the map's kind of interesting too. Hmm. Um, so they have that going for that, and then there's a hidden hidden uh, levels you can unlock in an arcade, which are pure like challenge environments. Um, like one of them is really narrow paths where you got to carry stuff and then like they start swaying and moving and you got to like move two per- two object uh, two person carrying objects across like swaying platforms where each individual like square component is like just slightly off from the one in front of it so it's like very easy to fall so they do have these dangle these rewards to do better and stuff like that but yeah pure chaos and just like a fun time killer basically to play um like very low stakes, honestly, low time investment. It's funny because I feel like so many of the aspects that <clears throat> you are describing for moving out do remind me exactly of Good Job, where it feels like they're kind of occupying a, a similar space. And something that playing that with you and Ian was really interesting because I was really into it. But then we got to that flower stage where we had to water all the flowers and I was just like, this is awful and is no fun just trying to find this like one last flower. We don't know where it is. It just felt like it completely destroyed the momentum. Does that happen at all and moving mm-hmm. out where there's like some challenge where you're like, ah, this sucks? In the two hours we played, not really. Nothing that okay. approached that because I remember the flower level uh, and good job. Also that really high rise level, like that factory level mm. where, where like that one with the like pl- moving elevator platforms. That one was really frustrating as well in, in Good Job, but in moving out, 
I, I think they put a lot of emphasis on making sure the environments were well designed. They're not very big. No matter how mm. much elaborate they get, they're now I think a lot of the levels in Good Job are way bigger than yeah, what you the, see. The factory in level felt out. like it was too big. Yeah. yeah from what uh, I was watching. I, I, I think it's fine. And I, I think they get very clever with like playing with like multi floor uh shenanigans and stuff that you gotta have to deal with or just um playing with your expectations oh this looks like a small environment oh but now they're like switches and like well do we stand on the switch oh you can put objects on the switch to open paths and it's like we got a coordinate so it's got like it, it i think it taps more into the overcooked mentality especially in the co-op aspect of it mm. where you can see the path it's just coordinating like it's easier right. to see the path and coordinate whereas in good job it's like all of you are struggling to figure out what uh it takes a while to figure out everything. That's the meat of it. Once you figure it out, it's easy and good job. Like, oh, that's it. It's the that's the hurdle. Or I don't think it's as much. That's as much the hurdle. In uh, it's more the execution in in, in moving out. Uh, were you playing this on Switch? So we were playing this on uh, PC Steam because there is no online co-op, so we had to use a uh, remote play with Steam. Okay. Um, so that's how we did it, and we did three players towards up to four player. Uh, but it is obviously out on other platforms as well, so you can play it that way. It just it is a bit of a bummer that does not support uh, online co op. That mm -hmm. that seems like a really missed opportunity. Yeah, um, I mean, especially I, I, now, right? Yeah, even yeah. with like creators' intent, like like what are you talking about? Like couch co op. I mean, it's only one screen, but at the same time, like that. I I, I I don't think I can think of a good argument other than like either they just didn't have the budget for it or they couldn't get it to run very well, which is unfortunate. But it, it feels like it definitely needed it. Hubert, tell me about Daymare 1998. I have no idea what this is. So, Ben, earlier you were talking about wanting more games, third-person survival horror games like Dead Space yes, and Resident Evil. Yes, I do. I really do. That's what this game is. Is it oh. good? Because that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the qualifier, right? That like, not I do quite. want more of them, but I want them to be good. Okay. Almost. What's the setup? Okay, so the setup is... This is a, a low-budget game. It, it okay. came out on Steam, I believe, last year. Mm. Pretty positive reviews. Like, I would say the, the, the community feedback of this game is like swimming in sevens, right? This game is... It's got ideas it's got a vibe it has the love for the 90s survival horror genre um but the setup is there's basically like i only got four or five hours in and then i got pretty frustrated and and stopped but there's you're part of this like task force and you're sent in to stop the bioweapons you know very resident evil very by the book um, there is quite a bit of story, though, um, and it goes places. It gets pretty crazy. There is some shock value. It's shocking. You play as a couple characters, but what made me stop, and it's really hard for me to stop games. Mm. Like, I love finishing games. I love seeing things through to the credits, and I got five hours into this game, and I was just like, all right, I think I'm good because I'm getting frustrated. And I can usually put up fr with frustration, but when the game isn't good mm. and you're frustrated, it's just too much for me. So, you know, it has the Resident Evil 2 remake, Resident Evil 3 Dead Space vibe of over the shoulder mm. and, you know, monsters are coming at you and it's limited resources, but visually it's just a little muddy the enemies don't have convincing feedback when you shoot them. I feel like there's kind of a lag, too. You don't really feel like you're hitting them, but they kind of fly back. Um, uh, the shotgun is okay. Which is kind of shotgun's grace. okay is like, yeah, might as not well. an endorsement. No. <laughs> yeah. I pulled this game up on Steam, Huber, just to take a look at yeah. it. <clears throat> and, boy, I think something that goes underappreciated sometimes, and this is just a knee-jerk reaction, right? I haven't played the game. Mm -hmm. The enemies look so generic. Like, there's just kind yeah. of this generic vibe going on. Like, it just looks like monsters that you would find in any horror game. And I, I think... Totally. You know, that that is something that Res both Resident Evil and, like, Silent Hill do exceptionally Evil well. Within. Evil Within. Yeah. Uh, 
I would say less so than the other two, but like just really amazing, distinct, creepy enemies. Yeah. Hell yeah. Safe head, dude. Legend. Yeah. <laughs> Safe head's good. Safe. The Birkin. Birkin. Pyramid head. Pyramid head. All yeah. those. The trifecta right mm-hmm. there. Um, yeah, but this game couldn't get into the characters, you know, I was just really trying and it just, it didn't feel good to move around and kill things and find items and progress, you know, I just never had a good time. And it was also putting up with all that and then just getting lost, like the game, you move really slow, there's no waypoints, so it's really hardcore, which I love, Mm -hmm. you know, it asks you to really immerse yourself in this space uh, without much help in the, in terms of like where to go. So it asks you to get immersed, but when it's not really fun to survive and, and progress, then then getting lost just isn't fun. Mm. So I kind of wandered around a couple times and then was like, I'm fully lost and I'm not having any fun. I'm kind of over mm. it. So I really hope that this series does continue though despite me criticizing the game because i feel like this game is close man it's so close to being a hidden gem of the genre and we need more games like this like you were saying earlier Mm -hmm. and i feel like it can do it you know maybe if i had given it a little extra time i put like five full hours in and i heard the game is only like 10 um but i really wanted to like it more than i did and and i hope maybe with another crack at it they can get it right for sure yeah i i it's interesting because like it's just personal preference but i feel like i can burn through third person survival horror games much more easily than i can like the first person you're being chased by an unkillable thing where it's like (laughs) i like that but only in very small doses and it felt like as far as video games went the horror genre really chased after that Uh, pretty hard for a while and was like ah no i like uh you know being able to see my character and get attached to them um have you know inventory management be such a huge deal that sort of thing and so i i hope we're getting more of that in the next generation evil within 2 was so good and felt like it was really pushing forward (sighs) that style of game in a really interesting way and, and and kind of like incorporating open world stuff and in a Spartan considered way, but then it just like dries up, you know, and then, then yeah. where is it? And then it's like, it feels, sometimes it just feels like an entire, an entire genre. is sort of, yeah. we got Resident Evil three, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know, it, that's, it's so short. I know that's the main criticism. It's a, such a short game, right. but right. Yeah. At least with Resident Evil, kind of the, the saving grace there is, I feel like we're getting so many different, interesting Resident Evil things. Like they may not mm-hmm. all be the same quality, but it's nice getting like a Resident Evil 7 and then 2 and 3 remake and then having like revelations to mess around with. Um, yeah. And resistance. And like, and, I, yeah. Yeah. Resistance and and I love when, I love when horror games do different things and they really hone in on their own unique mechanics. Right. Like managing your ammo in this game. Mm. Daymare was so intense. It's like you have a slow and a fast reload. If you do the slow reload, It takes a while, but it like transfers your bullets into the next clip. Whereas if you do the fast one, it's instant, but you leave the clip on the ground. So you have to go and then like pick it up. So like there was something kind of cool there. And then there's like the the fast uh, med kit versus the slow. So cool mechanics, but just didn't fully pan out for me. Uh, Huber, if you... If we can like get into the studio again and like use the index and stuff, that's actually something I'd really be excited for you to see with Half Life Alex. Is yes. in a lot of ways, here, it's pretty much a horror game, and you have <laughs> moments like where you're in the dark and you can't see, and you just have this hand flashlight, and just the act of you know emptying out the clip and then like reaching behind you and putting it back in adds so much to oh, so the awesome. tension. Yeah. I, I'm excited for like you. reloading as it's coming towards yeah. you. Just oh like, yeah. Oh. We're just like flying by your head. It's, <laughs> it's really sick. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about Huber, it's, it's going to be leaning on you again. A lot of Huber games today, but, uh, I've been playing a lot of games. The control DLC, the foundation. Mm. Yes. How's that treating you? Amazing. What is it? So this is the not the first DLC, but the first expansion. There's two expansions for oh, Control. Oh, my bad, my bad. 
Yep. The, uh, what's up? No, no, no. I I refer to it as DLC, not expansion. That oh no, you know, I did the, like classification. I did stuff, the same so. thing. Yeah, I did the same thing earlier. I was I was talking about it on Syndrome, and I think I said DLC, and I was like, well, technically it's the first expansion, right. but it's not the first DLC. But so it's the first big story expansion of which there are going to be two, and on its surface, I wasn't that hyped because you're going to this cave system and i was like oh my gosh going into some cave boring caves everything's just going to be rocks everywhere like whatever you know i really like the the visuals of control but i just don't think ca- caves will really do it for mm-hmm. me and boy was i pleasantly surprised and the thing i want to hammer home is r- really hyping up DLC, meaningful DLC and returning to a game and having a reason to. And it was just so nice slipping back into the world of control. I'd been gone for so long and I treated this as like going to the movie theater, honestly, Mm -hmm. or like, uh, you know, watching one of your favorite shows every week. It was a one night thing, four hours of, of DLC, just its own self-contained story from from start to finish Mm -hmm. and i just loved it 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 introduces some new new mechanics for control um and i don't want to get into too many details because this is a game that you want to experience for yourself i'm gonna story i'm gonna press you for some details i want to focus on (laughs) these caves uh, cuz you yeah. say caves and I'm not excited either yeah you know, that's like, <laughs> exciting that, i know i know i know so I know. so so sell me on the caves I will say you on the caves, you get a mechanic, you get a cool mechanic where you can manipulate rocks. So you have this kind of like geokinesis power vibe. Geokinesis um, is such and, a good word. Sounds like a and, planet uh, in Star Wars. <laughs> uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, somebody has geokinesis that I stole it from them. <laughs> um, yeah, like, it still controls so it still looks cool. The idea that people were in these caves studying mm. them is really cool so it's not like you're just so going through these empty caves it's like this is the yeah, remnants of what happened yeah totally there's there's environmental storytelling for sure and there are some surprises that i'm not going to spoil and it's just really nice revisiting this world i can't stress enough and it made me hunger for more control like i did I, like i didn't even know how badly i wanted more until i was playing through this dlc huber um you know, I think there are a lot of negatives that come along with, you know, like constant updates to games and DLC and all that <laughs> stuff that we've talked about to death. But I do I do also really appreciate it because it, it just brings back things back into the conversation and, you know, my own radar in a way that it wouldn't before. Like uh, yeah. Remnant from the Ashes just had a DLC yeah. update and it was like, I completely forgot that that game existed. You know, I played a little bit and I I liked it. And, you know, just because of this update and people streaming it again, I would love to give that another shot. And I think that's really healthy. You did? Okay. (laughs) But I I love that effect. You know, things keep coming up uh, in such a good way. Totally. And, like, this was IGN's game of the year. And, I didn't even know that, actually. Yeah, it came out. We loved it. And it's like, okay, moving on because there's always another game, always another game. So it's just nice to have a real meaningful excuse and a reason to go back and revisit great games. Control is a great game and it's just, it's just awesome. Like going back in, you know how, like Resident Evil 3, right? Everybody wants Resident Evil 3 DLC. We want a reason to go back to Raccoon City. We want the clock tower or different character perspectives. And it's like, that's never a guarantee that we're going to get that. So it was just really nice hopping back into control. Especially knowing there's one more big one coming that's supposed to be the main event and really the thing they've been teasing since the main game. Oh. So hyped. So, so hyped. Gotcha. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I definitely appreciate that line of thinking and having that appreciation for being able to come back to a game like that, like having the incentive I just, and uh, this is not speaking to the quality of any of these expansion slash DLC updates. Uh, uh, I personally just don't really like significant DLC coming out for a standalone single player game so far after the original release, even if it's marketed at like ahead of time that this is going to be the plan. I, I, I would generally prefer if they held that stuff as 
because you know we, uh, there are people always talking about like demos, which games get demos and stuff like that. And I feel like a specific piece of DLC, especially the one that's meant to be like a either a stepping stone to the, the sequel in terms of continuity or just like a side story thing would serve better as like the appetizer to the sequel. Like when say they're making a, tr a control two and they save something like this to be a lead into it. Um, because I'm, I'm usually more excited to get back into uh, like the, the next main installment. I, 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 for sort of a reason, I just hate having to wait more than like a month for any significant deal. So like we're talking, you mentioned RE3 Huber. Uh, I mean, it's because of its pedigree, the fact that it's a remake of a, a really good, a really great game, and it's Resident Evil, which holds a lot of sway with someone like me and obviously like the rest of us. But for I mean, as good as Control was for me, I love that game. I thought it was fantastic as well. Um, whatever, like it's just not. It, I'm just not gonna get excited about DLC for that game a month after more than a month after it's come out. Damiani, dude, I, just... I, I agree with you on some things and I disagree with you on some things here. I was with you when I wasn't really excited and I honestly kind of forced myself to dive back in because there had been such a long gap mm -hmm. because it felt like I didn't, you know, I wasn't in the mindset of that universe. So it is a little bit jarring, obviously, returning. Um, but then as soon as I booted it up, you know, I think breaking that seal open, it's like, oh my god, I have missed control. Mm. I love this game. I, I forgot how much I love just being in the Federal Bureau of Control. And to your other point, these two expansions, dude, definitely not required to enjoy the main game to its fullest extent. Guaranteed setting up the future of the franchise. Oh, yeah. Like, you're uh, talking about setting up a sequel. I think that's the point of these is to set up a sequel. For, for sure. I guess either I would just personally prefer if DLC was held too closer to a sequel. <laughs> like, it, like, to serve in place of a demo. Like, take a place of a demo. Or make a demo, like, a meaningful story thing. Like, so, many, so much effort goes into demos. Like, especially in the current situation. We're hearing, like, why certain things aren't having live or, like, gameplay demos right now. Because it takes a significant amount of resources away from game development. Whereas if it's something that could be potentially, like, monetized. Like, you, we, earlier we were talking about Dead Rising 2. It had that, like, what was it, $5 for, like, the, the prequel? Put out, like, yeah. a, one of these for, like, five, ten bucks. If they'd save this to, like, Control 2's, like, marketing campaign and be like, hey... It's coming out like in May, whatever year, but in January or February, you can play this DLC, which is a lead into it or something like that'll get you reacclimated. So like, oh yeah, I remember this world. I remember the controls, stuff like that. And I don't know, like, I, I, I guess that's just how I prefer to do things. I like finality and conclusions and resolutions. They don't have to be like definitive resolutions. I just like an ending of some kind to a single player game I play and then having oh, that waiting period. I don't like... Uh, and, and and like the anthology, like making a, a more media anthology, like same thing with serialized things, Huber. I know you've loved like serialized things, like The Walking Dead and uh, Life is Strange, but those things I just prefer to play when they're all all the chapters are done, and I can just play it all at once. I I hate that waiting thing. Just like we're going through a Final Fantasy VII remake right now, I freaking hate that how like the potential of how long we have to wait for multiple. Hours. I hate this stuff. I'd rather have a finish and then let's go to the next one. Don't like. I'm not. I'm not insinuating that they were withholding stuff for the purpose of DLC. That's not the argument I'm making here. I mean, is like uh, in terms of satisfaction, fulfillment. Uh, I want to feel. I feel fulfilled after control. I don't want to have to like feel a need to come back just a few months later for uh, like a, a side piece of content. And if it's significant enough, just hold it till the next game or as a lead into the next game. I I want to spoil something, but I can't. <laughs> I, damn it, man! I, I agree and, and disagree at the same time. Like I really sympathize with a lot of your feelings, Damiani. But I think just like the demanding nature of making this stuff, it, it's just not realistic a lot of times to have it a month after release. You know, it takes more time than that. Yeah. And I, I think the only time I get burned is when you feel like the DLC is kind of filling a void that you wish the main game would have left. But, the, like the but that, this game DLC. does not. <laughs> but That's like a Castlevania and a Prince of Persia situation, for sure. I actually appreciate it because if, if I feel satisfied by the main game and, and I decide that I want more, sometimes it's nice having the option. Like a, a fairly recent example is I played through 
um, Batman Arkham City. And I felt really, <laughs> except for some of the true ending stuff, but I felt, for, mo- for the most part, very satisfied. Arkham Knight? Arkham Knight. That's what I meant. Knight. I said City. Cool. Cool, cool, meant cool. Knight. Yep. Just wrong title. I got you. My I bad. Got you. <laughs> Arkham Knight, yes, on PS4 I was yeah. playing it. And um, I finished it, and I was like, I just want the DLC. And it, was, I, it wasn't essential by any means. I didn't need to play yeah. as Batgirl. I didn't need to play as Robin or Nightwing or Harley Quinn. But I had fun doing it, and I appreciated that the option was there just because I wanted more. And so I think if you can nice. find that balance, it's okay. When it's like... Oh man, I feel like I've got to wait a year just for it to answer crucial questions mm. or whatever. Then that, it's, then brutal, it's brutal. Yeah, but. yeah I, I know not everyone thinks like me either. I know there are definitely people who appreciate it. I, I my, to better elaborate, just really quick. Mm. Uh, I like to move on to other things eventually uh, when it comes yeah, to single yeah, yeah. player stuff or even like heavily narrative driven stuff. I like finality and then like I need I want something else, not from maybe that that story realm, but like just another game, another like movie, whatever. Just because I, I, that's how I work, and I think the best way to put this is it's uh, it's fun. It's fear fear of missing out basically when they put out these deals like these games that maybe not as heavily invested in, but I appreciate them, really like them, and they put out these significant pieces of DLC or expansions. A decent amount of time after when I've I've personally moved on from it, and then we go into two. It's like, oh, I forgot to play those DLCs. Crap! Like, it, it, but people already were talking about it, discussing it. I, 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 I kind of it, it, it just gives me anxiety and stuff. And I'm like, damn it, I'm gonna forget about this. And it feels like there's always so much your backlog, so much to play and stuff. It just adds sure, to that. Sure. To that. That's where yeah. I'm coming from. I get you. I get you. Um, there's a lot of good DLC out there. Ben, damn it! Damn it, Ben! You're just you're so just long mad ago. <laughs> no, because uh, I I had forgotten to tell you a game that I played because I beat it like right after I think I was on a frame trap, and then that was so long ago. I haven't been on one in so yeah. long, and this DLC talk is reminding me of Metro Exodus. Yeah, Metro Exodus. <laughs> Dude, the DLC. I gotta get to the DLC. Was so awesome. It's one of those things, Huber, where like. Something will remind me of it. I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta get to it, and then I just forget it again. You know, I and know, then like right. when you're thinking of stuff to play, it doesn't even enter your brain. Yeah. It's the worst. DLC, dude, DLC is easy to forget. Yeah, it like, is. It's, it's been, it's like uh, I had never played like some of the Assassin's Creed DLC, and I was like trying to go back. That's and why some of that. It's just definitely slips through the cracks. I think you're right, Damiani, of like the, the distance. You you mentioned uh, getting away from the noise when playing a game, Huber. Uh, sometimes that can be really useful when you get around to a game that and all the DLC is out rather than like playing it right at release and then waiting for the DLC. Cause when you wait and all the DLC is there, you just do it, you know, as soon as you finish the main game, which is really, really nice. And so that's a benefit as well. Um, but speaking of keeping things in your mind, I hope you keep this otake in your mind. Uh, I was hesitant to talk about this one because I know it's uh, a little bit heartbreaking, but I figured with Huber here, and this being so close to his heart, uh, I wanted to bring it up. I think there's a lot to say on it. I want to talk about the effect of leaks, and specifically... We're not going to talk about the specific no, 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 no. leaks, No, 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 no. So okay. to, to, so not, I've dodged them. Not just okay. to uh, you, Whew. Huber, and you, Michael Domini. We're not going to be talking about the specifics at all. We're not even going to be grazing the details of those leaks specifically. I just want to talk about the effect and the conversation surrounding this Last of Us 2 leak situation because it's been pretty fascinating, uh, pretty devastating. Uh, some some major stuff uh, has gotten spoiled uh, for people. And really the, the conversation has evolved where initially it was reported on that it was a disgruntled employee that was flying around and then Sony come out came out and said, no, this has nothing to do with Naughty Dog. They're not employed. It's, you know, it's these non-associated hackers. And just seeing how the conversation and blame has shifted as the story has evolved is really, really fascinating. And so I think there's a ton to dig into here. Um, But what I want to start with is, do you think these leaks have an impact on the final game in any capacity. And what I mean by that is, do you think it has altered perception in any significant way? Do you think it will impact reviews or sales or anything like that? Oh, I mean... 
I don't think it'll impact reviewer sales. I think this game is selling selling out no matter what. I agree. You I know, agree. like, you know, like before Final Fantasy VII came, before, big games are going to sell. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I, I just don't think the average person cares about this stuff. The, the, mm, even yeah. if it's in, they see it in headlines, it just flies right over their head. They just don't. It's like, oh, it's a talk. That's a topic of headline today. Cool. And they forget about it like a day or two later. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll let you finish your thought though, Huber. But like, I definitely agree that sales wise and like review wise, this isn't gonna do. It's not even a blip on the radar. Like for that. No. But you were saying, um, Huber. Yeah, it freaking sucks though, and I think subconsciously there is gonna be a little bit of, you know, that thought in my mind when I'm playing the game of like, even though I don't know what the spoilers are, like. But then at the same time, it's like, I don't know. It, it's just such a muddy situation. I, I haven't been spoiled, but the fact that I know spoilers are out there is kind of a spoiler. But then at the same time, it's The Last of Us, so you know crazy shit's going to go down. And as long as you don't know what the crazy shit is, you're fine. <laughs> so, I don't know. It, it's. I will tell you, though, Ben, it has added to... A, it has added a pressure onto The Last of Us that I don't think was there before the What leaks. is the nature of the pressure? Everything about this game, like, I think... It's hard to put into words, but I feel like there is just, like, s- sky-high expectations. Mm. There's pressure now, like, pressure from Naughty Dog. They're all depressed, like, noise, man. There's so much noise around this game. It's one of the most anticipated games of all time, like... There's just a lot with The Last of Us Part Two coming out, and I, I think this is just adding more pressure and more stakes and more noise and just, like, more tension of, like, ah, Last of Us. For me, at least. I don't know. I'm trying to remain calm and keep it out of my mind, but, you know, this, this controversy, like, I was f- totally fine and the game was out of my mind, mm-hmm. but now this controversy has kind of stirred up a hornet's nest of, like, Last of Us tension. <laughs> I think it's frustrating when you can't take a game on its own terms. When like you're sitting down to play and it's like I'm not just thinking about this thing and my reaction to it. I'm thinking about the controversy that led up to it. It's it's always weird having any sort of controversy cloud hang over a game. It's it's never fun in my opinion. Um, but I think something that I want to pose to you is and, and again we can talk about scale. Um, you know, you mentioned that the average person probably isn't even aware of this, and I, I generally agree with that. But I think, you know, among the enthusiast crowd, it's weird seeing people respond to the leaks and being like, oh, I hate this. I don't like the, you know, not liking something out of context. It's like that raises a bunch of questions when it's like, well, You've decided that you don't like this, so then are you going to play the game to confirm that you don't like this? Like, are you going to be going into it with this initial bias? Do you think that's do you think that's an issue at all? Do you think it's that's not something to worry about? I think everyone's going to go into it differently. I think people are ready to love it, ready to hate it. You know, it's just we all bring our own mm-hmm. emotions and vibes and expectations into every game, so... Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm more heartbroken for the developers and for the fans who love this game, right. Last of Us, and got spoiled. Like that's that's devastating, man. Like if I had been spoiled on some of the God of War stuff, like not cool, mm. not cool, not fun. And then I've been doing a lot of thinking too. Like, should we have even? Should people have even reported this? Should this have been a headline? If nobody had mentioned it at all anywhere, would it have slid under the radar unless people have been spoiled? Or did it give people that didn't get spoiled an, a warning? Like, I heard the headline, so then I knew, like... Right. Mute all oh, Last of Us conversations everywhere. Like, oh my god, media blackout. I mean, yeah, I, I, <laughs> so I, I, I don't necessarily... Th- I kind of will take a stance in saying that it probably... I mean, it's going to be reported on. It's better it comes from more official sources who can report it factually instead of like making it more of an opinion thing where it can be a little exaggerated and kind of like color people's impressions a little bit more. 
Um, I think that's where it gets a little bit dangerous. So it's like better when official news outlets, you know, or official like news blogs, especially gaming sites, do report on it and just like you know say what happened and stuff and like keep it as that. Um, but yeah, Huber. I mean, I, I do. Like, like the same thing just happened with uh, whatever, like, like um, the Mario sixty four PC mod or whatever. Like, fans got really angry about uh, Game Explain and one other site, uh, Go Nintendo, reporting on it. They're blaming those sites for getting it shut down. They're like, you guys need to learn to stop reporting on fan projects and stuff because you spread the word and Nintendo shuts them down. And it's like, well, so, like, sorry, they were doing te like, technically those things are illegal. You know the risk. <laughs> like everyone knows the if you don't know the risk, then that's your ignorance. And like ignorance does not excuse you from that. But at the end of the day, people just doing their jobs. As long as they're not like exaggerating or reporting fake stuff, that's their job, and they're and like that's fine. Like people have a right to have information and then make their that's and how you make informed decisions. I, I, I and I understand. Like I agree with you, Huber. This is probably the most upsetting for the developers. They're probably like, it's most mental damage to them. They're the ones most invested in it. It's their work. It's their livelihood. And they're probably, in their minds, it's probably the biggest like deal to them. Like this is the hugest issue. Even to like hardcore fans, like, like even like, like you, Huber, I think you even being spoiled on this is like not as bad as it is to them knowing it's potentially can now be spoiled. Uh, it won't be played on their terms. But at the same time, I mean... It, it, it's, a, it's a bad situation, but I, I do think people need to not have knee-jerk reactions to, like, the reactions to what was said in it. We don't, obviously we're not going over it, I don't want to know what it's going over it, um, and I'm drawing it, I'm, I mean, I saw some of the outrage being directed at Naughty Dog over these supposed things, I mean, I even watched the, I, I mean... I think the best succinct way to put it is watch the Mega 64 video about them making fun of it. That's my thoughts on the situation. It's like, the, the, like people getting outraged over a minuscule amount of footage from like, a supposedly the longest, biggest game they've ever made. It's like a fraction of the game has been revealed and there's no context. The people don't know, like people just drawing these conclusions, like just play the game. And you know what? It, it's not that hard to like, there have been times, like, the biggest twist, I don't, I'm not for this, but in any medium, the biggest twist being spoiled does suck. Like, there's no two ways around that. But, like, if you're hearing something and you don't know the context, like, when a trailer in front of your face from a lot of these games, Square Enix specifically, Notorious for doing this, showing you ending in the trailer, but you don't know it. You just don't know what you're seeing. If you don't know what you're seeing, it's like, until you get there, you're like, oh, shit, like, that's cool. I but still don't think they it, should do that. <laughs> they should. I mean, there's a, I mean, movies are bad. Movies do put a little too much context. I think the key is context. If you just don't know the context of what the heck you're seeing, it's like a fashion shot or something rapid and it, 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 it's it, it, like someone who knows everything like they know what they're doing with it that's good but at the same time uh i don't know i guess the weird thing is just from my perspective i have a very easy way of dealing with this i just treat everything as like it's not true I don't care if it's being reported on. I'm just like, I'm going to tell my brain, any doubt everything. Until you play yeah, it, you do all. not know what is true. And as long it's like, as just, long as you have a seed of doubt, you'll yeah. be safe. Thankfully, there's still a long way to go. Thankfully, I've dodged Dude, the did this with Final now. Fantasy VII Remake. <laughs> because going through social media and stuff, even like Square Next was tweeting like video clips. And like, I would see it and like, it would register for a second. I kind of think I know what this is, but I just move past it really quick and be like whatever You're like who cares what that was like uh, you like don't even think about it move on and this is just advice for people who like are freaking out about this just try and like just try and treat it as like gossip and don't focus don't tr focus on other stuff and stop dwelling on it because i feel like you're it's really i know though, but man. like the, the, like if Endgame had gotten well, spoiled for me, yeah, like I think some people do this themselves so though a little bit as well. Sure, like, but you, I, you I think to, I you think need to relax a little bit and like. I that's, that's hard, undermining man. that's undermining the people that are like going into twitch chat and just dropping bombs it's like well people aren't oh, doing okay, that like themselves. assholes who are like so yeah, too, yeah, sorry think, let me clarify this people who go out of their way to drop something in your face and, yeah. and, and like shove it in your face that sucks and this does lead to more likelihood of that yes. but at the same time the people who like just still want to like do social media and like have their normal life while like big events are happening like when endgame was coming out you either got to avoid everything, and if you want to do that to yourself, that's fine. Or, you know, just, like, chill and be like, 
I, I don't know. Like, I think like the focus on like the thing's gonna be good. Like, I can't wait to see it. Doesn't matter what I see about this in advance. I'm 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 gonna try not to see anything about this. I'll do my best. But man, like with the full movie context, seeing it all at once, like that's where like I'm gonna get the most meaning out of it and stuff. I've I've sort of learned to like I don't actively seek out spoilers, but I've started to come find like an inner peace of that any information that's like, given to you. At, like it's not the whole thing as long as someone just show me the whole thing which is like impossible to do i'm still gonna be able to preserve that first experience of watching it and seeing it like as part of the whole work of art and i'm gonna be able to appreciate that and it's got so much more meaning to whatever the hell i saw out of context it's like I i'm gonna be like if anything it's gonna like if you dwell on it you're gonna start coming up with these unreasonable expectations i feel it might color how you're going to play the game like what you're if you have expectations going into it you're, you you might if something doesn't happen because you saw something now you're disappointed it's like i could see that being the pitfall honestly versus the actual thing was spoiled versus it's out of context and now you have these bizarre expectations i think more than the the spoilers themselves i just feel for the creative team and and seeing the vitriol that that Neil Druckmann has had pointed his direction is the worst because and i'm not i am not in any way saying these two things are equivalent i'm just trying to make a comparison to illustrate a point, but like even streaming, for example, right? Like I've had streams where uh, I feel like the audience has been like very just chill and supportive and fun. And then I've had streams where it's like, oh man, like there are some jerks that are just like spoiling the whole mood and I don't want to do this anymore. Like it's a two way street, right? The way the audience reacts to something will change your attitude on making stuff whatever it is it really doesn't matter what it is and so i just feel okay horrible just, for yeah. for naughty dog because it's like man i this would just suck out all the motivation that i have right where it's like you have just these it just feels hopeless and outside of your control and it's just like this thing that you've spent years years of your life uh is just kind of like going up in flames right in front of your eyes before you have a chance to really properly present it the way that you want to present it. And so my hope is that this comes out and, you know, it, it, it gets a good reception and it kind of picks them back up, you know, assuming that the game deserves all of it and whatever. But uh, I, I just, I, I hope this doesn't hurt their drive to create ultimately. It's yeah. Very good point there, Ben. Like, uh, it's absolutely. I agree with you. It, it it's shitty. It puts that level of like stress on the developers, and yeah, people di like directing their hate at Naughty Dog based on that. I think that's the real danger here. I think that's the real danger because now that's even adding more shit onto their the developer's plate they have to deal with. And people are reading about all this hate. So like, why are people getting so angry? This must be bad now. Right, I, I do right. see the danger in this. This is like, this is the real thing. And this is why I, I, I do champion people reporting on it and like reporting it as like neutral facts and stuff and not putting an opinion like here here's the leaks the game is leaked by the way we took a look at it and it sucks you better watch out for this when it happens like come like whatever you're free to do that but, and, like, but YouTube opinion. channels are doing exactly I know that, but like, like I mean awful, that's yeah. gonna happen like on right. like you know, like through like various avenues like mess boards YouTube social media um, and it's unavoidable and that sucks and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you can do honestly about that, except like it's a personal thing where you need to like try and. I mean, the developers, I don't know what to do. I'm not in their position. I don't envy them being no. in that position. That sucks. I hope you find a way to find peace and like that the the game comes out. It's great. Everyone loves it, and everyone can look back and laugh on the dumb leak of a month before it came mm -hmm. out and be like, "That was it ended up being nothing. We're fine." You know, let's learn. Uh, you know, whoever needs to learn lessons, learn lessons from it. But at the same time, like Kingdom Hearts three, whole game leaked early. Final Fantasy seven remake, whole thing got data mined, and you know, stuff was out there about those things and stuff. And I've, almost every game pretty much gets leaked at this point. Um, mm -hmm. It's just really interesting to see the kind of this hate campaign being raised against Naughty Dog over, it's not even the whole game leak, it's just parts of it out of context, mm -hmm. and people are just directing, like, it almost seems like people just want to find a reason to hate more on Naughty Dog, and like, you're using this as like, the catalyst, you know, to like a rallying cry, you know, it's, yeah, I, I think there's like a little bit of an agenda going on here compared to the other stuff, but... You know that that's I'm hoping just kind of disappointing. 
I'm hoping just one month from now it'll be in the back. The, you know, it'll right go away and uh, the noise will be quieted. You know, like I don't know how many people have been spoiled. You know, I, I would I I wonder. <laughs> If it's a huge swath of people or like less than 1% of the people who are going to play this game. Right. So, you know, hopefully when you boot it up and uh, the Gustavo guitar plays and you see that Last of Us Part 2 menu, hopefully all this noise goes down and we can all just get in the mood and uh, get ready. Yeah. For I, I... what is... Uh, going to be a great game, hopefully. I agree. I, I think right now that's sort of the best case scenario where it just seems... <laughs> nasty and awful right now but with the speed uh-huh. at with which news happens and everything is yeah. going i hope we like put if this, this happened three us. weeks from now yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Like if agree. it had happened a week before the game came out that would be horrible because this would ride right into launch mm-hmm. hopefully by the when the calendar turns you know this is an afterthought uh are we ready for some emails sure oh yeah Nice. Uh, speaking of Final Fantasy VII Remake, our first email is about Final Fantasy VII. And it's a question that I have as well. Hmm. This comes Sick. in from Jake. Hello, Ben and panel. I am currently playing Final Fantasy VII Remake and having a great time. I recently had an epiphany about leveling up and collecting summons. Will this even matter in the long run? In a normal RPG, this type of this type, you gather skills and abilities as you progress through the story, giving you a tremendous sense of accomplishment. How do you think part two will handle this? Do you think our abilities will carry over or it will be the dreaded, now you're back at level one again, have fun with your basic fire spell? How might their decision impact the game and the series? I think they're going to add a new mechanic. I think the level cap will be raised. I really think you're going to import your character. They're going to raise the level cap to 100. I really, really feel that. Um, as for the materia, that's where things get weird. That's why I think they're going to add a new mechanic to build on top of materia, materia that then you have to level up. Yeah, a uh, little bit of a peek behind the curtain on uh, our uh, the, the second spoiler mode we were talking about this. This question did come up, and this is where we got on the ideas, um, especially materia. I mean, there were some cool ideas about uh, like triple links, maybe, or uh, instead of just like the double links, uh, cross links between armor and weapons to maybe have some like gear set effects and stuff like that would be really cool. Like, uh, I mean, I don't remember the specifics, but if you pay a dollar on Patreon and go check it out, you can listen to all those ideas. But uh, the specifics <laughs> of those ideas, I can't remember them all. I had it all prepared in notes and stuff. Those ideas. There was ahead something of time. about that that promotion that's just. It was like that was like brand manager right there. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Uh, For just one dollar. Yeah, right? but I mean, I do fully expect like <laughs> some uh, you to take some kind of hit to your materia. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I I think it's either gonna be divvied up. You might like get a reduction in the like if you had four of one, you might get knocked down to just one of like a healing. It's like well, you're just down to one right now. Uh, I expect like the cast to expand, so I think like even if you had three or four, you're gonna probably need more anyway. I mean there's there's also material they haven't uh fully expanded upon yet. Enemy skills one of those. They could completely blow that open and make a character be able to play like a Beastmaster type class instead. That's uh, some way they could explore that. That would be really awesome. And uh, I, I, I mean, there's a whole, we don't have to get in how they achieve that, but I agree with Huber. I think there does probably going to be a new hook or some kind of mechanic uh, around materia beyond just like increasing the amount you get, increasing their level, and like increasing the slots on like the weapon and armor spot for sure. I do think just starting over again completely at level one would be deflating for me. Uh, I, I think I'm, I, if they, I will. I don't know. Just oh, raise the level cap, man. Is this a, man. Is this a bet style. opportunity? Because I was like, I'm betting everything <laughs> that they will not start you at level one again. Or start you, you at nothing. You bet everything? I bet that's, everything. You don't, you don't start that's the at ultimate like, bet, Damiani. You don't start, like, at, like, you don't is... start at like nothing again. Like It's Wait. like you have no material. Like You're starting from scratch. Like that's Absolutely gonna be the, not. There's the no way. It makes allies. no sense. I bet, I bet easy allies. That's no. my wager. I yeah. wager easy allies. That'll be like the, the end of easy allies. The easy allies apocalypse. Like we're betting like pink slips and like our savings accounts. Yeah. We, we like, like part two announces that they say we're starting you at level 50. And then like we serve Patreon double. Yeah. <laughs> we bet you, you have to double our Patreon <laughs> double if we get Patreon. this bet right. Yeah. Double or nothing. Here we go. Uh, oh God. 
Our next email comes in from Eric. Hey, Ben and Allies, Xbox first party games have been the punchline all generation. I don't think it's eventually deserved, but not... I don't think it's entirely deserved, but not entirely undeserved either. I think there's no denying they're on a hot streak currently. Gears 5, Static Decays 2, Juggernaut Edition, Age of Empires 2, Definitive Edition, Gears Tactics, Ori and the Will of the Wisp, The Outer Worlds, and the recent content updates to Sea of Thieves are all undisputed bangers. Only Bleeding Edge hasn't been a hit for them recently. And coming up is a lot of great-looking ones, Minecraft Dungeon, Wasteland 3, uh... Wait, Outer Worlds is not first party exclusive anyway uh tell me why grounded crossfire flight simulator age of empires 4 psychonauts 2 battletoads and cuphead the delicious last course all reasons for being excited uh and maybe equally important look at the diversity of genres in that lineup not to mention the gorilla that is halo infinite only in the midst of a turning point for xbox game studios is it already time to give them their due considering all the great releases they've had since autumn yeah, I think they've got some momentum going. I think um, two of those games were Gears, though. So, I mean, that's still the punchline, right? <laughs> two Gears games in that list. Another Halo coming. Like, for how good those games always are, it there is something to be said about routine and expectations, right. you know? Like, for as good as Assassin's Creed always is, it's one of my favorite franchises ever. I will never get sick of it. Knock on wood. Uh, they're still... Even, even with next gen coming, like Valhalla can only be so exciting because we get them all the time. Um, yeah, I, I think routine is a really good word there, Huber. I, to me, I think uh, Xbox first party falls into two traps mm-hmm. where, especially this generation, like he mentioned the state of decay two here. State of Decay 2 was like an absolute mess at launch. Um, sea of Thieves w- was underwhelming at launch. Like they, they've, they've kind of had this history of putting stuff out and then eventually making it better with some of their biggest titles, which I think hurts momentum. I think you want to come out the gate swinging, right? I think that's important. Um, but the other thing is that routine. So like Gears Tactics, like I've played some Gears Tactics and it's it's this weird position where it's good, but it's also not really exciting me. Like, it's just... Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is technically well done in certain aspects, but it feels like they kind of took the XCOM template, mixed it with Gears, and you get what you would expect from that combination in a weird way. Like, it's not... It's not blowing me away. It's just... Yeah. I think Xbox sometimes like has that problem where it's it's good but not exciting. Like it's another one of these. Yeah, they play it safe. Yeah, they do, and they try to appease to their hardcore fans, which to maybe like not shake it up too much because they want to m- remain loyal. Well, and I feel like when they they don't play it safe, they don't really knock it out of the park, and so it's it's kind of this mm-hmm. weird combination of stuff i do commend them for improving things right like like yes, seeing absolutely seeing see if thieves turn around the way it did was really cool and um their commitment to Ori some hype. of this stuff is really good and so i i do think there are plenty of things worth commending absolutely um and there are some just absolute bangers that were uh console exclusive for a time like cuphead uh for example um, Microsoft is doing a lot of cool things, but I, as far as like first party stuff, I don't know. I, I can't say that like I'm, I'm jumping up and down. Hellblade 2. I'm yeah. Excited. yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, but, uh, it's funny this morning. I think, was it this morning? I was looking into Halo. Did I post you that? Did. You did. You said morning? you were getting hyped on Halo. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm getting hyped on Halo because I was like, when the hell was the last Halo? And it was in 2015 mm-hmm. was Halo 5. Like that is a long gap. So so I'm I think because the gap's been so long, I'm like I'm ready, dude. I'm itching for some Halo. Yeah. So I hope it, like Infinite there's a lot of pressure on Infinite, man. Like next gen launch, Microsoft momentum, Halo big franchise. Like I really hope Halo reaches those highs of innovation and and renovation or <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh just shout out to Ori and the Will of the Wisps. That is, yeah, yeah that's yes. it. Yeah. I was going to mention, game. yeah, that, that that that's out. I mean, it's phenomenal game. It's really good. And I hope that the studio acquisitions they've made, that they've yeah. been touting and alluding to, that will be paying off 
uh, in the coming years, especially with the launch of Series X, that that this is something that they've invested a lot in, and we're going to see the fruits of their labor soon. Um, it, it's something it, I, I think it was a problem that took a, it was a problem with no easy solution. That was going to take it was no quick fix for it. I think they tried quick fixes here and there, and none of those panned out. They all came out like with the problems you're talking about. Those were like the the games that like maybe they did stick with them eventually and make them better, but there was a whole slew of problems with a lot of the stuff they tried to do. Um, and I, I think they're trying to right the ship and they realize it's going to be a, a very time intensive, resource intensive process. And I think, I hope, hoping <laughs> that we're getting near the finish line where they could start showing us those games and that Microsoft returns back to here are games you can only get on Xbox Series X or Xbox One, whatever the, they decide to put them out on, probably just hopefully also Series X. And those games are, make us think back to like the 360. 360 era because Xbox 360 era I remember games being exclusive to the system being like it was you had a compelling reason to own a 360 beyond all these other services they have great backwards compatibility they have great services there's no denying that like the Microsoft does do a lot of, a lot of things right but that can only win over so many people I think first party software is the most important part of the equation and I, I mean we've been this dead horse so much it's just they they just, they, they, they just lacked They've slacked on that part for so long, and I would love to see them turn around because it'll make things interesting again. It'll be nice mm -hmm. to be like, can't wait to see what like this new series is and like you know who's working on it. To be excited for like Xbox again because it's, it's honestly it's been getting a little boring hearing everybody like Nintendo's first party games are so great, Sony's first party games are so great. Where's my? It's like it's so old at this point. This broken record. I'm just tired of it. I want something new. <laughs> Agreed. That's that's the great thing about new gens. You get new yep. new stories. Halo Infinite, dude. Please be a 10 out of 10. You mentioned uh, the please. stakes for Last of Us 2. <laughs> I feel that sort of pressure for Halo Infinite. Yeah. For sure. Like, dude, here is the reason to have a Series yeah. X. Put up or shut up. Let's go. <laughs> Our last email comes in from Chris. Dearest allies... I became aware of the existence of mock reviews after I started working in the game industry several years ago. For those who have never heard of them before, my understanding is that developers pay games journalists to produce reviews for them, which they then use to shape their marketing strategies. The reviews themselves, of course, never see the light of day, and I've never heard them openly discussed by outlets that cover games. My question to the panel is this. Have you always been aware of mock reviews? Are they not openly discussed because there's some kind of taboo surrounding them? Given that they're never publicly released, it seems odd to pretend they don't exist. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, um, I feel like this question was on the Q and A. Was it? I've was heard it? This question I don't think before. I've ever I heard this like, question. I feel like because I have never heard in mock reviews, but I have I oh, really? heard this question. I feel like yeah, I've like never. One heard of my of biggest this fears with this show is repeating questions, which I have done. So I may be repeating this question. This I is, think it's a good one. But yeah, but but either way, Ben, it was on the Q. It wasn't on Frame Traps. Okay, so okay. you're good. Um, I before I started working in the industry, I, I didn't know these things existed. Uh, I became aware of them when I worked at Game Trailers because uh, uh, people who worked there would tell me about the these things that happen. Like that, this is a thing that exists. I just hear them in passing about stories. Um, the one thing I always that was always addressed when these came up is that uh, the stance, at least at Game Trailers, the stance was. Uh, we, we don't do these. And if you do one of these things, it's a line you cross. You cross this line, you are not supposed to come back over. It means if you write mock reviews, you are not supposed to come over and or be able to be a reviewer for a, an outlet again. That, right. like, in, in terms of an eth ethics standpoint, that's how it's supposed to work. So if you write mock reviews and stuff and you still try and review games like for an outlet, that's a big no-no. You're not supposed to do that. Um, I don't know of any... I don't know of anyone personally who's ever done that, like both, bo like tried to do both and stuff like that. But I mean, that's a that's a huge risk. I would not advise anyone to take that. But I mean, you, you it's you have it's a conflict of interest basically. You just right. have to have a clean break, one or the other. You can do one or the other, but you cannot be doing both. You're doing both. Right then you're in conflict of interest. And then most outlets at the time, this is like 10 years ago, viewed it. If you went to do mock reviews and you were known for doing it, you couldn't cross back over because now the the the, the specter of the, like, there's like the shadow of like, 
you might have a conflict of interest. It just sows enough doubt in the minds of readers or viewers that that person used to review games for like EA or whatever got paid to tell them stuff like how you know them, they're not still loyal to them and stuff like it, that's enough doubt. Like that is that questions the journalistic integrity of the outlet. So that's what I meant by like you usually cannot cross back over the line once you go over it. It's ill-advised basically. I, um, yeah. I haven't heard of anyone doing both at the same time because obviously that's a conflict of interest but i don't think their existence is is like wrong or taboo oh no 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 i think think, yeah i don't think there's anything wrong with companies using them as a tool to gauge the quality of their thing you know I, I, i don't think like the the act of them existing is bad in any way um, yeah, as long uh, as the, yeah. as long as that conflict of interest exactly. obviously if, if, isn't present. Like, let's yeah. say at the end of like your journalist, like you you're defining journalism or whatever, just normal reviews, like fulfilling might be a fun. Fin- most of the time, it's a financial thing. It's just like right. industry is not paying you enough. You don't want to be a game developer. Maybe that's not your background. You can't exceed there. You don't want to go work in like PR marketing for whatever reason. Someone comes up to you and is like, hey, like we'll pay. You. Like they usually call it, like a consultant. I think like if you'll be a consultant and come like tell us what's up with this game it's like you're basically doing like a mock review but also like continuously giving them feedback uh i I think i've heard of people who start like consulting agencies what they do is they get called in they'll play the game write up a report for them which is the mock review and then turn that over to the studio and be like if you were to release this game we predict it's going to get like this score and it's going to sell probably about this many games you know usually not the sales estimates but they generally tell you this is what outlets are probably going to give your game they used to be i did hear specifically they used to have to give you like what probably the metacritic average would be because they used to deter- like determine bonuses and all that they wanted like all those details from like a mock reviewer or consultant agency like that and I mean, if that's what you want to do and, like, you like that, that's your job and stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly valid job. It's just there were stories about people potentially doing both, and that's a huge conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get, like, the stories of people, like, oh, they're paid, they're bribed, or, like, you know, so-and-so bought that score and stuff like that. That's where that, like, those biases come from is people, like, hearsay from that, but... Tangible example. How much did you get yeah, paid like, for this review? We, yeah, I remember, like it's always funny to see like Bloodworth. Like, what was it like a year or two ago? Like, when we started Easy Allies. He legitimately think finally got the first email directed at us at an outlet asking us to would we set money for a review? He goes, "I have never seen this before. <laughs> this is the first time I've seen this. I didn't believe this was a real thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> someone would be this. It's <laughs> actually yeah, real. Would actually have the guts to do this. Like, and he was like, "No." <laughs> I was like, "Cold blooded, perfect." Wasn't it like? priced out too like if you give us a 10 we'll give you more i have no idea shit. but like, like i would give like, I, I think whatever it was in slack is like oh man these are they're, these are real but Crazy. i think it sort of evolved though into the gray line of uh when influencers became more uh yeah. companies came more reliant on influencers and we had that uh the controversy which led to like the fcc requiring you to disclose when you're being compensated for a, pro- a product i that think was always that was like the next like step of the evolution of like someone can we can pay someone and tell us this or we could like pay someone to play this and like be positive. like that's where I think the that sowed more distrust was that error. Mm-hmm. Like uh, like it re, uh, re, sorry revitalized that like speculation about hmm who gets paid to really say good things about stuff and who it doesn't. It was it was so frustrating yeah. working at game trailers and people being like oh how much should you do they pay you for this review? We only trust influencers. And it's like, dude, the influencers are the ones getting the deals, getting the money, yeah, getting the- actually paid <laughs> to say good things. And everyone points their it finger at, really- like, the big corporate game trailers. And it was so it's, frustrating. Yeah, it's, it was like, no, The dude. amount of, like, <laughs> I, I'd be surprised. I really wish some people could have seen uh, been a fly in the wall some of the stuff at game trailers for, like, how thorough the regulation stuff is. So there are games that were Viacom properties that we had uh, that we were covering. Like one of them was I reviewed a South Park game while at game trailers, and I'm like, of course I watched the show, but I have nothing to do with South Park Studios or anything on that team and stuff. But I do work for this company, so we had to put a big ass disclosure at the beginning of the video, like legal text that the lawyers had to go over and be like, you need to specifically wow. say this stuff. Just you just have to be transparent. Literally say you work for this company, and like we, you know, obviously you know there's like a the the to say there is no stake here is like complete bullshit. 
It's like, I mean, I personally do like South Park. Even I hated it. It's like, that does bad. The company does bad. It does technically affect me on some level, potentially. You have to disclose that. So I was like, mm -hmm. of course, this makes sense. But the the loophole, uh, the, 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 the the rings we had, the, the hoops we had to jump through to 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 appease certain things to make sure all the, the, uh, the cross the T's and dot the I's before it went out was just insane sometimes, that process. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's... <laughs> I could totally see from an audience perspective, though, how things can look gray or confusing. So I am sympathetic to that. But yeah, as long as you're not trying to do both at the same time, I I think people are just doing it as a job completely unrelated to professional reviews that show up on, on Metacritic or anything like that. Uh, but that's going to do it for emails. Thank you, everybody who wrote in. Uh, really good questions. If you would like to email... Frame trap, have us ponder your thoughts. <laughs> Email askeasyallies at gmail.com. Huge thank you to my wonderful Mike and Mike duo panelists, Michael Huber and Michael Damiani. Um, yeah, and if you would like to get this beefy podcast early, you can become a $5 uh, patron on Patreon, patreon.com slash easyallies, where you can get Frame Trap, the Easy Allies podcast. You can get that stuff early, and as well as other shows. Um, so you can consume it two days roughly early than the, uh, the publicly scheduled ones. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to everybody who tuned in. Hopefully the audio quality is a little bit better on this episode. It's not as dark in my apartment, so the lighting isn't quite as rough, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, let us know. Give us feedback until next time.